Hello, beautiful people. I am Oliver Perrin for Semigog, and I will be joined in just a moment today by Anteos, and I am very pleased it is so. We began the Light in Darkness series uh, a little over a year ago now, I believe. It's certainly been about one year since our last episode. We had previously done our introduction to this series, and we had done the first episode on uh, Florentine Banks and uh, Hermeticism. And we'll be picking up that thread here. Uh, Anteos has been off in the wilderness learning the uh, the secret lore and returns to us with um, uh, refreshed wisdom to share. Um, so I, I'm very, very much looking forward to uh, talking to him about this. It was a great discussion last time. I thank everyone uh, who will be joining us today. We'll give everyone a few minutes to uh, come in and uh, fill out our uh, live viewership. Uh, in the meantime, I will ask you to please follow this channel, Semiagog, as well as a safer space. You can do that on YouTube. You can do it on BitChute. You can do it on Odyssey. I particularly hope um, that you will uh, follow it on Odyssey. Uh, you can also find me over on uh, Twitter, on Gab, on Minds. Uh, and Telegram uh, increasingly these days. The last things I have to show, um, I'm gonna briefly mention my friend's book. I won't go into it today, but this is Dream God by my buddy, uh, Brendan Hurd. Uh, he was kind enough to promote my book recently, so I'm doing the same for him. You can find it, it's uh, The Dream God. You can find it on Amazon under Brendan M.P. Hurd, um, H-E-A-R-D. And then there is my uh, sci-fi book, Vinculum. You can find that on Amazon under the name Oliver Perrin. Uh, I recommend it highly, having written it. And then there is my collection of poems. You can find that on Amazon as well. This is Cinders from the Bloomery of Youth. Okay, uh, the last thing I need to do is thank the Praetorian Chads who make all of this possible. And uh, these are my patrons. Um, they are mighty. Uh, they are renowned. Uh, and if they are not, they should be. They are the ones who make all of this happen. Um, so yeah, as, as I say here, all of the credit and none of the blame, uh, they go a long way towards making uh, all of this possible on the channel. So I will bring in our guest now, the mighty Anteos, uh, coming to us from some German-speaking land. Uh, Anteos, um, I do recall you have your mute on. Excellent. Um, uh, welcome, sir. Is there anything that you want to say just in introduction? Yeah, hey, Semigog. Uh, it's very good to be on again. Um, as you said, uh, as you've probably guessed from my accent, uh, I hail from the German lands. Um, I'm a student of history. Uh, I'm a little disaffected by the way universities are run, and I thought I'll go to the internet. I think it was first on uh, JF's channel, uh, the public space, um, now uh, JFG tonight. I think it's there that you discovered me and you proposed a cooperation where we delve into mysticism, secret societies, and I'm happy that we are at this at the third round now. Yes, as am I, and I'm glad that you brought up JF. Since I poached one of his guests, um, I should certainly um, uh, uh, call out his channel. Uh, it is now known as JFG Tonight. Uh, I certainly recommend his channel. I was a guest on it uh, several times back in the day. Uh, JFG uh, was... Um, kind enough to um, help me get my uh, channel rolling by having me on as a guest. So definitely check him out. If you don't know him already, I would expect that uh, that most of you do. Um, the only other thing I would say before we get started, ladies and gentlemen, is something that I mentioned in these previous streams in the past. Anteos and I um, are basically uh, doing all of this as a kind of preliminary investigation. Now we're, you know, we digging into it with some thoroughness, uh, given the format and the rest. It's not like we're putting together a printed work. Um, so we're not just pulling things out of our asses. We're not just guessing. But this is certainly a preliminary investigation. Um, you should uh, go and check it out for yourself to fill in uh, any gaps that we leave as we jump over these different phases of history. It is a lot of ground to cover. Um, so, you know, we're going to obviously emphasize some things or maybe things that we uh, miss. And uh, if we do, we certainly will. Um, please let us know in the comments, um, certainly about um, aspects that we might not have covered or things that you need, uh, think need uh, more attention. So uh, how did this work? In our first one, we gave sort of an overview of what we wanted to look at. And the scope of it was roughly running from the Florentine Neoplatonists. 
um, you know, the era of Cosimo de' Medici, the visit of uh, Gemistus Plethon and the rest, all the way up, uh, you know, it, we'll, we'll have to see how far this goes, but we were hoping at least to get as far as the French Revolution. Um, and the main focus of this was to look at secret societies as well as sort of secret wisdom. And in particular, this sort of dual valence in terms of secret societies, because on the one hand, you have the aspect where it's, you know, your secret club of special knowledge, like being initiated into mysteries or something, right? So you have the idea of, uh, of um, like Freemasons or a secret society in that respect, where they, you know, teach you passwords and a special handshake and um, you wear a special ring and you get told secrets, right? Um, but then we also have sort of the idea of a secret society in terms of like three letter agencies, right? And the idea that these are people with secret knowledge about how the world works, um, but it is not just passive knowledge. It is knowledge that allows them to shape events or to affect human affairs and the rest. And that these people often move behind the scenes. And part of the original motivation for talking about this was the idea that um, there was an overlap between these two things that necessarily people with secret wisdom in a secret club would end up with secret knowledge, which would allow secret influence. And then, you know, the step from that to the idea of a three letter agency or Christians in action or whatever didn't seem uh, Seem, seem like too big of one. Anyway, that, that's an aspect of this that I wanted to look at, certainly. Um, and then there's your particular interest in things like the rise of the, of, of the uh, Illuminati and the rest. So this should be a very interesting ride. I'm sorry to be so long winded. That's just sort of bring people up to speed. If you haven't seen the previous two episodes, I definitely recommend you go do that. There's a number one and a number two in this series. But um, I've talked plenty here on Teos. Um, we can uh, we can move forward now. Uh, I will leave it up to you to guide us. Yes, thanks for the introduction. And uh, let's kick it off just very briefly with the recap of the last um, show that we had because uh, the Florentine Renaissance. OK, the screen is up because the Florentine Renaissance is really the basis for what we're going to talk about now uh, for the Reformation, for Rosicrucianism and later for Freemasonry and the Illuminati. Um, so you mentioned already uh, Gemistus Plethon, who arrived in Florence in 1438 as part of the Council of Florence. And he was a delegate of the Byzantine Empire, of the Byzantine Emperor, because at that moment, uh, uh, the Byzantine Empire was under the attack from the Turks, and there were plans to unite the two churches, the Catholic and the Orthodox Church. It didn't ca uh, come to be, but uh, Plethon was in Florence at that time, and he delivered uh, many speeches on Neoplatonism, on Plato, and he heavily criticized Aristotle and the ruling scholasticism of Thomas Aquinas. And what he wanted was a Platonic revival in Europe. And one of the listeners, of this of these lectures was Cosimo de Medici and um, Plethon must have had an impact because later Cosimo de Medici would become the patron uh, of the Florentine Renaissance of the rediscovery of the ancient texts and something that the contemporaries did not know about Plethon is that his goal was not just reviving Plato but his goal was replacing Christianity and Islam with a pagan society. Um, and we learn this from the Book of Laws. Uh, it was is a manuscript that uh, we only discovered after his death. And here he talks um, about these plans. He talks about how to uh, invoke uh, the spirits, uh, Zeus, Poseidon. Um, whom he considers as uh, living gods uh, living inside the planets. Um, and it's quite interesting to know that the impetus um, for the Florentine Renaissance came from a person who had these motives. Um, so we see, of course, that the Platonic ideas that, the, that these texts were could have a um, very subversive tendency, a subversive bend. Um, 
And let's uh, move on to Marsilio Ficino, who was the person who made this all happen. So um, at 26, he was discovered by Cosimo de' Medici. Cosimo gave him a villa in Careggi, a private tutor who taught him Greek and, most important, Greek manuscripts that he started translating. So the first one is the Corpus Hermeticum, uh, which was printed in 1472. So mind that the printing press was just invented some 20 years earlier. So this is one of the very, very first books that were printed in Europe. And it is about um, Hermes Trismegistus, who is a fusion of the Roman god Mercury, the Greek god Hermes, and the Egyptian god Toth. And at the time, it was believed that he lived at the time of Moses or even before. And therefore, his knowledge was more pure and people believed that he had direct access to God. In fact, those texts were written somewhere in the second century AD. But at the time of uh, Cosimo de Medici and Ficino, people believed that they were much older. And these texts introduced ideas of astrology, um, reincarnation um, and mysticism to Europe um, because according to Hermes Trismegistus um, God can encounter uh, man can encounter God through meditation um, and he will escape darkness and he will enter light and he will recognize the uh, universal ultimate truths um, and just as in uh, Plato, the uh, lower world is governed by the upper worlds, uh, by the celestial world, and the planets are in fact living gods. And man can uh, get in contact through invocations with those gods, and he can read the tendencies that are in the stars. So this leads to a revival in astrology and also in alchemy. There's a, there's two things uh, worth pointing out here. One that we covered in the previous stream is that because of an accident of fate, because they believed that the works of Hermes Trismegistus came from you know much earlier, that, that he in fact predated Moses and all sorts of other uh, uh, ideas that were then current, what happened was the milieu of the time period in which those texts were composed, that being the second century AD, it was, as we, as I said, we discussed in the previous stream, this was a time of great syncretism and um, the mixing of different currents and trends um, in that world. Remember the, 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 the world of, uh, of Hellenism and then up through the second century, you, you know, it was after Alexander had gone off to the east and the Persians had been conquered and, you know, the eastern and western Mediterranean, there was trade and the rest. So it was all seen as sort of one big world and all these elements were jumbled together. You had a, a, a former general of Alexander whose dynasty ran um, Egypt. You know, you just many different things were all jammed together. But because they believed that wrongly that the writings of Hermes Trismegistus were much older, they associated that syncretism with an early original wisdom. And so the model for them of the, um, the truest form of the earliest wisdom was absolutely riddled with syncretism. And, and so y you have people who see as their, their archetype that they must imitate, they see that archetype and its earliest form as being uh, syncretism and and so from very very early on you get this idea that the elements would all be uh, jumbled together and now i'm afraid i forgot my second point because i talked too long as i usually do so perhaps it will come back to me and i will will hand it back over to you Octavius. um yes uh, very well and it is also for this reason that cosimo de medici wanted marsilio ficino to translate the corpus hermeticum before the platonic corpus because uh, uh, Cosimo de' Medici was about to die and he urged Ficino to finish this translation so that he could at least read it before he died. Um, 
And the second groundbreaking translation by Ficino is the uh, Platonic Corpus. Um, so we are talking, uh, if it's translated in modern English, about 1,500 pages, a, a huge endeavor. Uh, during the Middle Ages, only three Platonic dialogues were known, but Ficino translates the Platonic dialogues from Greek into Latin. And this spreads like wildfire and really changes the way um, uh, Western Europeans think about morals, religion, about science. And the first argument I would make here is the Socratic method. Um, because Socrates in Plato's dialogues was a person that would go around and start discussions with Athenians, ask them, what do you think about, what is the good? Um, how should a society be run? And just by asking questions, he reveals contradictions. And if you read the Apology, uh, so a dialogue about the process against Socrates, you learn that the establishment was really pissed by Socrates, Socrates going around with a bunch of followers, ridiculing everybody. And what I think this is, uh, what I think this makes, if you read this, um, you, you, you then develop a critical thinking um, you develop an atmosphere in where it is possible to question what the church says. And we will see this play out uh, during the Reformation. Now, another thing is um, the uh, mentioning of uh, mystic uh, societies. Um, so, um, uh, in one dialogue, Socrates says that he has been initiated in the mystic societies and that because of this, after death, he will not be reborn as a lesser being, but he will dwell with the gods. Um, and this is something which is also um, in the Republic, uh, one of the most important dialogues of Plato, um, where the um, philosopher's king, so the ruler in Plato's ideal state, um, has to uh, go through moral perfection, he has to learn geometry, rhetoric, and then he has to come into uh, contact with God and be illuminated. Um, and this is also something that is present in the uh, Corpus Hermeticum, um, where Herm Hermes Trismegistus is practicing some form of meditation, and then he comes into contact with the divine mind and is enlightened. And this is a very, very common uh, thread among all the secret societies that we're going to look at. Um, alrighty, um, let's get to the next, the last person of the Florentine Renaissance that we need to talk about. Uh, so, Pico della Mirandola. Um, he uh, was also um, under the protection of Cosimo de' Medici in the same year when uh, Ficino published his Platonic Corpus in 1484. So Cosimo buys him a house and uh, gives him a pension. And Pico joins Ficino's uh, Platonic uh, Academy. And what is special about Ficino is that he learned Hebrew from a Jew named Flavius Mithridates, and he is the first Western European to practice Kabbalah and to publish works about Kabbalah. And two years later, in 1486, he does something uh, <laughs> really incredible. Um, he goes to Rome, he publishes his so-called 900 thesis and he challenges everybody in Rome, including cardinals, to discuss those theses publicly with him. So he's at that time, he's um, some 23 years old. So he's maybe just left university and he challenges uh, the leaders of the Catholic Church to discuss with him. Um, and uh, what he wants to do is he wants to take the knowledge of Aristotle, of Thomas Aquinas, of scholasticism, and 
um, bring it together, bring it in harmony with the so-called Prishi theolo theology, the ancient uh, theologians like Plato, like Kabbalistic texts, Hermes Trismegistus, Pythagoras, Zoroaster, Zoroaster, the Persian Magi. Um, and mind that people like Pythagoras and Plato um, were pagans, that they believed in reincarnation. And he wanted to bring this together with the Bible and the teachings of Thomas Aquinas. And of course, it backfired. And the Pope condemned the thesis. The thesis were burned. And the 900 Thesis were the first printed book that was universally banned by the church. Um, so here we have a uh, early sign of what later becomes institutionalized as the index of the right, and this is, church. And this, is, and this is prior to, excuse me, sorry to, to cut in on you. Um, but it, it's it's worth pointing out that this is sort of like the, uh, as you're suggesting, the first hint of coming Catholic uh, Counter Reformation Catholic reaction, and yet this is prior to uh, the Reformation, properly speaking. I mean, you'd had the Hussites, of course, um, who had been fairly successful, and they were in the area of the Kingdom of Bohemia, as a matter of fact, which we'll be seeing more of later. Um, but at this point, this is before uh, everything starts uh, going crazy. I mean, it's prior to uh, uh, Martin Luther at Wittenberg, isn't it? So, so we're seeing the beginning of Catholic reaction to this syncretism, this love of old lore. Um, you know, all the uh, all the business with um, the 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 secret wisdom of the ages. You know, there's. The reaction begins at this early point. Uh, yeah, you're right. So at this moment, it is about reforming the Catholic Church from within. And what Luther wanted was a reformation of the Catholic Church. He wanted to change the church. It was not his intention to set up a totally different one. Um, anyway, so Pico is then, he flees Rome and he is arrested in France. Uh, but it is, and it is only through the intervention of Cosimo de' Medici that he is freed and that he can return to Florence. Um, okay, and with this introduction, let's uh, move on to the Reformation and Rosicrucianism. Is there anything you wanted to add before we go there? Yeah, just one small thing, which is that, uh, as you pointed out, I think in our uh, last episode um, covering this same material, uh, Pico lived under a cloud for some time. But I, I don't believe I mentioned in this last episode that at, towards the end of his life, he sadly died very early. I think it was at like 34 or something. He did not live uh, much beyond all of this trouble that he ended up having. I think the trouble he got into was when he was right around 24. Um, and then he, by 34, 36, somewhere in his 30s and not his late 30s, uh, he ended up dying. Um, but between his returning in disgrace and, uh, you know, his, his Medici um, allies basically keeping his ass out of the fire. Um, the last event of his life was him falling under the influence of Savonarola. Um, and it's, it's uh, worthwhile to bring that up because Savonarola was a fire and brimstone preacher. Um, he was one of the ones who came up with this idea. I actually believe he's the big one who first pushed the idea of bonfires of the vanities of all this vain intellectual knowledge and all the rest that should be thrown on the fire because it was useless. So this Pico character is rather interesting insofar as he, you know, very young, very brash, um, dug deep into this secret lore and hidden wisdom. There are some of his texts talking about him losing his eyesight because he's trying to learn Hebrew so quickly during this period where he has access to a Jew who can teach him that he's, you know, staying up all night trying to look at all these uh, arcane texts on manuscript pages with poor light and it feels like he's going blind. This same uh, guy within, you know, within a 10 year period, he's returned to uh, Italy in disgrace. He's fallen under the influence of Savonarola. He's written a text, which is rather unexpected. You mentioned it in the last episode, which is contra, uh, I can't remember what it's basically contra, it's against the astrologers. 
Um, and he says that he doesn't buy into all that astrology nonsense. Some of that may have been him covering his ass after the fact, um, since he'd been in trouble. But most people tend to think he really believed it. Um, and it fits with him falling under the influence of uh, Savonarola. So we, we almost have a, a, a weird sort of reaction to this whole approach embodied in Pico himself. So it's not just that you, ha you have the Renaissance and then Reformation and then Catholic reaction. It's, it's almost that you have it not just in history, but in Pico himself uh, embodied. So sorry, that's a, that's a last little bit. Um, yeah, this is a phenom phenomenon which we also see in Botticelli. We know Botticelli for the for works like the Birth of the Venus, uh, for pagan um, topics, but um, it is under Savonarola that Botticelli, just like Pico, undergoes a fundamental change. And if you look at Botticello's paintings during Savonarola, uh, it is only pious content, so it is only about biblical content, and this, uh, and also the style of his art changes totally. So something very deep must have happened um, during Savonarola's reign. Um, yes, let's uh, jump into the first part, the Reformation. Um, so, of course, we have to start with Martin Luther and Pope Leo X. Pope Leo X was a great-grandson of Cosimo de' Medici, but unlike his great-grandfather, he was um, not very fond of Kabbalistic literature. Remember that Cosimo um, had Pico della Mirandola. He uh, protected Pico della Mirandola so that he could carry out his Kabbalistic studies, and he got him out of prison after he was arrested by the uh, Pope in France. But Pope Leo X, uh, at the beginning of his reign, um, most Jewish uh, texts um, on Kabbalah and on magic have already been seized and been burned. Um, but what is happening now is that other Westerners, other Christians, start picking up the idea of Kabbalah. One of them is Johannes Reuchlin who publishes an introduction to Kabbalah and um, his books are also seized by the Inquisition and they are burned and Pope Leo justifies this. Um, and Pope Leo then in 1516, uh, 1517 does something which outrages many people. So he, co he collects money for building the St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. And everybody who contributes money um, can get freed from a sin. This is called the sale of indulgences. And this causes an uproar, especially in Wittenberg, where Martin Luther lives. And Martin Luther um, nails his famous 95 thesis on the door of the Church of Wittenberg in 1517. And he criticizes the sale of indulgences he also criticizes some dogmas of the Catholic Church, like the purgatory, confession, the invocation of the saints. And he argues uh, he has a trinity, uh, which is sola fide, sola gratia, sola scriptura. Only faith, only God's grace, only the scripture. Only these three things are important for a Christian. So you could ask yourself, where does the church come in here? What is the role of the priests? Um, well, it is much less as it is in Catholicism. And of course, uh, Luther is threatened to be excu excommunicated by Pope Leo X. And when Luther receives this threat, uh, he immediately burns uh, the threat. He ma makes a bonfire. So these bonfires are also a very uh, old German tradition. Um, it happens very often. It, it happened very often. Right. At intervals, yeah, over the years, even some recently, yeah. And uh, after this, of course, Luther is officially excommunicated by the Pope, um, but his protector, Frederick III, 
the elector of Saxony, um, make sure that Luther can defend himself um, at the imperial diet of Worms. So uh, Frederick III is a very important prince in the Holy Roman Empire. And Luther then goes to the imperial diet of Worms. The imperial diet is something like the parliament of the Holy Roman Empire, made up of princes, kings, uh, free cities, and so on. And there he has to justify himself in front of the emperor, Charles V, who is a member of the House of Habsburg. So the House of Habsburg is going to be the villain uh, during this presentation, the villain of the Rosicrucians. Um, it's my, my traditional Catholic friends are going to be pissed, man. They're going to be like, how dare you? How dare you? Well, it's the enemies of the Rosicrucians. Uh, we, of course, are staying very objective here, and we're not taking sides, are we? Um, anyways, so um, Luther is in front of the Imperial Diet, and he says, I will not recant unless somebody shows me that what I have stated, what I have criticized, is justified by the Bible. Um, and my argument here is so usually in tr the traditional narrative is, oh, the church was so corrupt and they were uh, collecting these indulgences. Oh, how could they? And of course, there had to be a reformation. But I don't buy this traditional narrative. Um, so the church was always corrupt. Um, I mean, you had popes who had uh, prostitutes. Um, if, a, if you wanted to become pope, you had to bribe the cardinals. If you became a pope, you would fill all the important offices with your relatives. So, of course, the church had been corrupt, yes. Um, I don't buy this. Um, but what I see here in Martin Luther is this um, new Socratic spirit of questioning everything, of saying, okay, this is how you do it. Now, explain to me why. Okay, so uh, I just looked at the Bible. No, this is not the way we do it. So this is my explanation why the Reformation came about at this time, um, due to the Florentine Renaissance, due to the translation of the corpus uh, of the Platonic corpus. And another reason, of course, is also the invention of the printing press or the reinvention. The Chinese had it, had it earlier, but whatever. Um, because the 95 Theses of Luther were printed and they were disseminated throughout Europe in no time. So, And we cannot forget that the one... Um, the one place where Reformation had already occurred and they had managed to stick it out, to maintain it, to not be crushed, because plenty of others didn't. You know, the Qatari, Albigensian Crusade, Bogomils, all those kind of people tried to break, you know, and many other heresies prior to that, all those people had tried to, um, you know, come in with their own view on things, their own take, their own position, and they've been crushed. Um, but the one place where that did not happen was in the Holy Roman Empire, in the uh, general area of Bohemia, Bohemia. Now, of course, the Elector of Saxony, that's, that's, not, um, that's not Bohemia, um, but it is, uh, Saxony is southern Germany, is it not? Um, in any case, it's, uh, it's in the Holy Roman Empire. So, you know, it, uh, let's see, take a look here. That's Kingdom of Bohemia. Now, where's Saxony? Oh, it's right on the right on the border of it. Yes, indeed. Okay, um, so so yeah, that's something to remember. Also, is that the upheaval with the the German states? You know, that is one place where a reformation uh, of sorts had occurred with the Hussites that they had been able to maintain. Um, yes, and so. Uh, Martin Luther is in front of the imperial diet, and uh, the emperor asks him, "Okay, so are you going to recant?" And he says, "No, I will not." And then the Reichsacht is declared on him. This means that um, there's essentially a bounty on his head, and people are invited to catch him and deliver him to the imperial authorities. Um, 
But uh, I was just going to say, as I recall, that um, that uh, Saxon Lord or Lord of Saxony, I should say, um, who was protecting him, if I'm remembering correctly, he uh, he didn't even really get involved openly in the religious questions. He defended Luther or at least claimed to have defended Luther simply because he believed his own the the subjects of his rule must be. Um, must have access to a fair trial. I mean, it's just this this crazy stuff that's um, that's hard for us to imagine today. When you know the 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 past is always portrayed in movies as this muddy, dark, evil place. You know, with everybody barking and shrieking. You know, um, and we we have this idea of an aristocrat who said, "No, I'm going to protect him simply because the law must apply equally to all of my subjects." So, yeah. He might, might, might also have been trying not to piss off the Pope too badly, but it's, it's worth noting. Um, you have a very high esteem of Frederick III, the elector of Saxony. Um, I would uh, have a more Machiavellistic approach. I think he had an interest, uh, a dog in the game. Um, I must look into this uh, deeper, but I would suspect that for some reason he wanted more independence from the Pope. He must have Uh, I, I assume he was not happy with the influence of the Catholic Church in his domains. Um, yes, but uh, anyway, Luther manages to escape and safely returns to the electorate of Saxony, to Wittenberg, where he spends the rest of his life under the protection of Frederick III. And now you could say, what is going on here? So the imperial diet, the parliament of the Holy Roman Empire, just declared the Reichsacht against Martin Luther. So there's a bounty on his head. And then he returns to Saxon here and he marry, marries away and uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> nothing happens. So th the thing is, the Holy Roman Empire was a bundle of states with overlapping territory, imperial cities, Uh, bishops, dukes, princes, kings, and all those states were independent. So if you look at the cities of Bremen or Hamburg, at this time they were sovereign states. So in the end, if there was a prince who was powerful enough, he could more or less do whatever he pleased. And they already had in this situation, because of the Hussites, um, There was already some accommodation. I mean, I just don't know any other way to say it. And I'm probably butchering any number of historical subtleties that I failed to take account of. But there was accommodation of heresy within the Holy Roman Empire at this point. Otherwise, there wouldn't they would have eradicated the Hussites. So there must have been some, however small, precedent for, at least in some areas, for... Uh, accepting um, this difference of religious view. Um, and, and it would also, of course, be driven in part by what you're talking about, just how, how much of a mosaic the German states and you know principalities and all the rest were. Um, of course, there must have been precedent. And also, um, the electorate of uh, also Saxony was neighboring to Bohemia. So um, it is um, also not surprising that the Reformation would take its uh, big start uh, from Saxony, which was neighboring to Bohemia. Um, and so what does uh, Luther do? Um, he marries. I mean, uh, he was a monk. Uh, but once he becomes reformed, he says, okay, the Bible says nothing about priests, so I can go and uh, marry. And he had a lot of, lot of children. Um, and he does something else. He translates the Old and the New Testament into German. This process is finished 1534, and it is printed and disseminated throughout uh, the Holy Roman Empire. And this is not a small thing, because this takes away the power of interpretation from the Catholic Church, from the clergy, and it gives it to everybody who can read um, in the German language, not in Latin. And 
Protestantism then spreads through the most parts of Northern Europe, the Low Countries, uh, England, Scotland, Scandinavia um, become predominantly Protestant. The Holy Roman Empire, Switzerland and France have big Protestant populations. And uh, yes, this is um, the, so, so this wraps it up mostly with the Reformation. And now we are going to talk about the roots of the Rosicrucians. Uh, is there anything else you wanted to add before we go there? I just ate a piece of orange, oh. but no, uh, not not at this point, no. Oh, all right, good appetit. Um, uh, all righty, um, so um, this person is, um, con is, so if we look at the Rosicrucian manifestos, we will see that this person, Paracelsus, was probably um, the most important uh, person who prepared the ideas of the Rosicrucians. So his full... Uh, civil name is Theophrastus Bombastus von Hohenheim. And, of course, he's better known as Paracelsus. Uh, he was a Swiss doctor who traveled great parts of Europe, and he was briefly professor at Basel. And uh, during his life, he uh, wrote tons of books, but most of them were not published because they were too subversive and people didn't really understand what he was talking about. But it's really after his death that his ideas take on and become uh, very, very influential. And he criticizes the medical establishment for following the ideas of Galen. So Galen was the medical authority throughout the Middle Ages and through the early modern period. Um, and uh, Galen developed the, th the theory of the four humors hot, wet, dry, and cold. And according to Galen, every illness is due to an imbalance in these four humors. And the job of the physician is to bring the body in balance again. So for instance, if uh, it was very cold, um, then you could give the patient um, fruits from a hot country. Um, or if there was a problem with the liver, then uh, he would perform a venous section on the right hand. So venous section and clisters were also very um, uh, popular. Uh, maybe by not venous section. By venous section, of course, anteos means bleeding people. You know, yes. So um, and 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 just to add a little bit of a facet on top of that, the humors were understood to correspond to you know as as you said the the cold and hot and the wet and dry. But for example, you know they combine so the the cold and the dry come together in the melancholic humor, right? And it was understood, or you you have the sanguine, the phlegmatic, and the choleric, and these things had to be kept in balance. So uh, there was that as well as the doctrine of melathesia, which was the idea that the planets had dominion over certain parts of the body. And uh, tell me if I'm wrong, Anteus, but I believe uh, Paracelsus was someone who came in and said, screw the authority. We have to observe this with our eyes. We have to actually experiment. We, we must reject the idea of the textual authority in favor of actual experiment to find out, you know, um, how it how it needs to be done. Uh, exactly. He was uh, an alchemist, a practic uh, practitioner, and the medical establishment at that time, so we're talking uh, physicians, uh, we're talking professors at the medical faculties, they were well, well, well versed in theory. They knew which medicine to prescribe, they knew all the texts of Aristotle, Hippocrates, Galen, Avicenna, but they were not practitioners. For instance, surgery was performed by barbers. Um, the, the barber surgeon. That's why today we still have the barber pole that shows the uh, the red spiral, which was, we are told, um, comes from the idea of wrapping their uh, bloody rags around a post to advertise their practice. Exactly. And uh, Paracelsus called those physicians stupid monkeys, uh, stupid donkeys, 
And he said, a physician needs to be well-versed in theory and he has to be a practitioner at the same time. He has to go out in the wilderness, in the woods, in the forests, in the mountains. Um, and it is here that he collects the cures for the patient. Because Paracelsus didn't believe in the four humors or the four elements. He believed in his own notion of the tria, pri tria prima the three prime elements, if you will, which were mercury, sulfur, and salt. And everything was made of the combination of these three elements. And note, the first element is mercury. Mercury is quicksilver. Mercury is also uh, the Roman equivalent of Hermes, Hermes Trismegistus. Um, so we see here that Paracelsus has read his Hermes Trismegistus. Um, and Paracelsus argues, we have to collect these herbs um, or uh, minerals and we have to combine them through chemical processes, alchemical processes, and thereby we come up with a cure. And Yes, and and he he was uh, said to uh, if I'm remembering correctly. So don't you know come and tear me to pieces if I'm wrong. But if I remember correctly, he was the one who uh, recommended quicksilver or mercury as a treatment for syphilis, which was a huge problem uh, at that time, having come from the uh, the New World. So not only did did he recommend the uh, the compounding by the physician who was also a chemist. Of course, the, the distinction between chemistry and alchemy did not exi exist at this point. It wasn't like he was the crackpot alchemist and then there were the real chemists. At this time, there was only alchemy and he was the one proposing that you actually c compound the substances and put together the cures. Well, the, the fact is that the mercury cure, which I believe Paracelsus introduced, um, did work against syphilis, it actually did. Um, and it, it got used up until the 20th century, if I, if I remember correctly. Um, so not only did he ferret out some of these uh, cures, taking a radical new approach, saying that, you know, it's not just about balancing, you know, um, the humors like you would find in Galen. Um, he actually found uh, ways to treat the diseases with uh, chemicals or minerals or, you know, substances, uh, let us say. And he also, if I remember correctly, was someone who said that um, it's not just because of imbalances that the disease is something in and of itself. It is not simply an imbalance. It is a thing that has a reality of its own that must be addressed through this treatment. Uh, yes, you're totally right on this. And um, chemical analysis of Paracelsus bones has shown that the concentration of quicksilver was 10 times higher than normal. So he definitely was in constant contact with this element. And you, you just said that uh, he revolutionized the way we think about medicine. And in Germany, we still see it to this day. So if you go to a pharmacy, there's a good chance that the pharmacy will be called Paracelsus Apotheke, like Paracelsus Pharmacy. Um, and there's all, there are also many uh, medical societies in Germany who are named after Paracelsus. Um, and th there are parts in him where we as modern, rational humans who trust in the science would say, well, good job. For instance, uh, Paracelsus um, described the Huntington's disease, which is a neurodegenerative neuro brain disease. and. Uh, um, which people at that time called St. Vitus's dance because they believed St. Vitus, invocations to St. Vitus, could cure this disease. And he said, this is rubbish. You, you don't need to bother to uh, invoke St. Vitus. We just haven't found um, a cure for this. Um, so here he was really realistic. But then there are some things where we might say, what, what the fuck is going on? And contemporaries said just this. Uh, for instance, uh, he thought that the plague was caused by a spirit living in the sun. 
And this spirit is enraged by human beings living like animals. And as a punishment, the sun will whiplash uh, those men living like animals with sun rays. And this inflames the sulfur in those men, and then they get the plague. And you note, of, of course, that historically, uh, Apollo, much like I, th you see, I think you see it in, in many Indo-European myths, this parallel uh, between the idea of a sun god, an archer, and the ability to rain down disease. Because I think you see it with Rudra. Um, you certainly see it uh, in the, uh, the, uh, the Iliad. You know, in the opening pages of that, there's the argument on the beach between, you know, Agamemnon and uh, uh, Achilles. And um, Apollo gets pissed off and sends down disease among the Achaeans because of their, their moral failings. And he sends down his arrows, which sicken all of them. Of course, Apollo is the god of the sun. So it, it would sound to me as though you can hear an echo of that in Paracelsus saying that the sun itself sends down its punishing rays that cause the plague when men behave like beasts. Um, absolutely. <clears throat> this is a very fitting uh, analogy here. And as regards astrology, uh, Paracelsus, uh, in his um, uh, seven defenses that I've shown here on the right, um, he writes that um, a physician also has to be a astronomer, by which he means astrologist. And he needs to be able to tell future events um, by looking at the stars. And he writes that this is not through the Holy Spirit or Satan, but it's through the individual Kabbalistic spirit. So also uh, he must have read some works of uh, Pico della Mirandola or Johannes Reuchlin. And <clears throat> this conception of astrology is in violation with Catholic dogmas. Because uh, according to the predestination um, of, uh, the, of the dogma on predestination, there is free will. So man has to be able to choose whether he will sin or whether he will follow the laws of God. But if the stars have, a, have too big of an influence, then this free will is not present. And, and that, was, that was exactly the argument as I'm sure you know, but just for our listeners, that was the heart of the argument that Pico made in his later years uh, against the astrologers. The idea that it it, it made a it, it made a joke of the uh, critical doctrine in uh, the church of the idea of human free will. And you might ask, so okay, yeah, he's writing about medicine and he's criticizing those authorities here and there, but so what? In the end, it's all about healing people. Um, but we will see just as today with politicized medicine, that medicine is not just medicine, but it's also a tool of power. And um, I'm going to show you some example where this plays out. So, um, for instance, in 1580, so around about uh, 40 years after his death, all of Paracelsus' books are put on the index in Italy. They are not put on the index in the Holy Roman Empire or in France or in England, but in Italy, nobody is allowed to read, disseminate or possess the works of Paracelsus. Just for our viewers who don't know, most of you doubtless do, but just in case, the index is the index prohibitorum. That is the idea of the, the list of proscribed uh, books uh, that the church does not allow you to to read. And I'm going to stop my uh, camera momentarily, but I'm still here and listening, uh, Antaeus. All right. And in 1593, we have another, um, so to say, scandal in France. So here, um, Henry the Fourth becomes king of France by um, uh, by by moving to Catholicism. So before he was the leader of the Huguenots, the Calvinist party in France, but then he converts to Catholicism in order to become king of France. And although he's the 
king of France and Catholic, he is still very friendly towards Calvinism. For instance, he has a Calvinist physician. And this Calvinist physician is also a follower of Paracelsus. And he publishes some works where he criticizes the establishment and he takes up the microcosm, macrocosm metaphor that Paracelsus also uses. And this Calvinist physician um, is immediately attacked by the uh, faculty of medicine in Paris and another uh, physician, Jean Riolon, who is also a physician to Charles IV, um, criticizes uh, Duchenne, uh, so this Calvinist uh, physician for his theories. And um, you then have another physician, uh, Theodore de Mayer, who defends Duchenne, who defends Paracelsus. And this physician later becomes court physician of James I, whom we will talk about later. So what we see here in the Renaissance, um, a physician was not just a physician. So Trump and Biden, of course, they also have their physicians, yes. But they see them, hey, how, I'm, how am I doing? Uh, how is my blood? Okay, bye. They will not consult their physicians on politics. But back in the days, it was very different because the physician uh, was uh, educated on history, on the ancient texts, on politics. Maybe he was versed in alchemy and astrology. Oh, and if he was an astrologer, he could tell the king uh, a thing or two about whether to wage war and when to wage war. Yeah, this is an important point to make here as well. As I mentioned with uh, alchemy, there was not this division into, you know, alchemy is a pseudoscience and chemistry is something that was real. Uh, similarly, we have the situation where astronomy as distinct from astrology did not properly exist yet. Uh, and as I pointed out, this doctrine called melothesia, the idea that the planets have a direct uh, influence and relationship with organs and parts of the body. So I think it's it might be in the, the Book of Hours of the Duke of Berry, but there's a very famous image of a human figure in a vesica piscis, um, and it shows uh, like like the, the Aries and the ram horns near a part of the body and the crab of cancer near a part of the body because the, the celestial influences, this is all fundamentally Neoplatonic by the way, affect different parts of the bodies and they do so at their greatest influence at different times. And so uh, to come back to Anteos's point, the physician had to know astrology for two reasons. One, because there was understood to be a relationship between given planets and given organs. Um, and therefore they would have to know about astrology to know, you know, about the signs and how they affected the body or the planets, etc. But also because of the, the, the different times when the influence of a given planet was greatest. So the idea is if you're dealing with an organ that's ruled by the moon, then based on their theory, you would experience the, the greatest trouble or the least trouble depending. Uh, uh, with that organ related to the moon when the moon was full or when the moon was new, right? So the, the physician literally had to be able to draw up horoscopes or to know where the planets were in the sky at a given time. So by its very nature, someone who um, could be, could get away, if he was serving a rich lord, he could get away with a certain amount of astrology because it was understood to be a part of medicine and he wasn't using it to make predictions. He was using it to treat the body so it falls more under natural science. Um, but that same person could just as easily draw up a horoscope as well. So just another uh, dimension there to what uh, Anteus was talking about. All right, and with that, uh, let's kick it over to the second, probably most influential person on the Rosicrucians. Uh, can you imagine who I'm talking about here, possibly? I think it's someone who uh, wrote a book and, um, and probably did not like Jesuits very much. I'm just guessing. <laughs> uh, nobody we're talking about like the Jesuits. Um, <laughs> I mean, of course, in the audience, we have huge fans. And I mean, I respect the Jesuits. Um, they are great. Um, Jesuits rock. But anyway, okay. 
Uh, John D. Oh, I thought it was I thought it was Johann Valentin Andre. Sorry, I'm I'm too I'm too early. We, yes, uh, we we were still um, talking about the people who in who kind of laid the groundwork for the Rosicrucians. Uh, yes, uh, John D. Um, highly highly interesting figure. Um, he was a uh, Renaissance Renaissance magician. Um, and as such, he was also accused of black magic under uh, Queen Mary I, who was Catholic. And he was briefly incarcerated. Um, of course, an Englishman, uh, a Welsh Englishman, uh, briefly incarcerated under the Catholic Queen. But then, uh, luckily, Elizabeth I ascended the throne in 1558, and she was Protestant. And with her, things went much better. He became her personal astrologer, as we just said. Uh, he amassed a huge number of books, 4,000, uh, around about 4,000. He had the biggest library in England at that time. He coined the term British Empire in his book on the perfect art of navigation, where he proposed that Great Britain should develop a naval fleet. Um, because at this time already, he saw that Great Britain had the um, potential first to protect itself from European invasions and to go out into the world and to conquer great parts of the world. And the English at that point had the example not only of the uh, early uh, Portuguese explorers who had traveled uh, all over the place by that time, uh, and the Spanish as well. And as we talked about in one of our episodes, uh, much of the funding for that exploration by the Portuguese and the Spanish came from Italian banks. Um, these northern countries, uh, they had to look closer to home at first in terms of how to develop uh, shipping and trade. And so they turned to the Hansa, you know, the Hanseatic League and, um, you know, uh, going up into the North Sea and trading with the Baltic countries and uh, Russia as well. So the, the English obviously had a shipbuilding and a, 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 a seaborne trade tradition, but um, they were playing catch up. Um, you know, the, both the, the British uh, East India Company and the Dutch um, developed uh, in, uh, to, to a large extent because they had to, because so much wealth was coming in. You have to remember that th they're Protestants at this time and they're concerned about the Catholic world. And this is at a time when Spain was just obscenely rich from um, New World holdings and New World gold. And what a lot of people don't understand is that at this time, uh, of course, you've got the Habsburgs in the West and the Habsburgs in the East. And because of their family relationships and the rest, um, the Habsburgs in the East, um, in the, the different uh, German principalities and states, had quite a bit to do with New World trade. And uh, there were bankers, and I wrote down their names, uh, the Fuggers, who were originally written uh, Fuckers, <clears throat> the Fuckers of Augsburg, and uh, the Welslers, uh, Welsers, two major banks from Germany at this time, um, they began to eclipse the Medicis in their wealth. Um, so these are Holy Roman Empire bankers. Again, like the Medicis, we're not talking about Jews here. Um, they're, uh, they're Europeans. And they were staggeringly wealthy. wealthy. If anybody wants to look up the Fuggers, F-U-G-G-E-R-S, you'll see that it was just, they were far more wealthy than people we even imagine today. <clears throat> Their wealth measured in the hundreds of billions of dollars. And so, you know, when we think about, for example, uh, the Portuguese or the Spanish sending their fleets out, and coming back with new world gold and having, you know, sugarcane plantations and the rest and early forms of them, or maybe tobacco at this point, you know, I'm, I'm not quite sure about the date, but, um, we think to ourselves, oh, that's just Habsburgs in Spain. No, because of their family relationships, that wealth was pouring in large part into um, the Holy Roman Empire as well, which created all kinds of headaches for uh, Protestant princes. And so you've got the Protestant queen in England, and you've got Bohemia, 
which is an early Protestant experiment that um, managed to hold. And so we can see the stage set, though I'm sure there are many things Anteus wants to talk about first. Uh, we see the stage set for the possibility of uh, uh, an alliance between the, um, the Brits and, uh, and the kingdom of Bohemia. It takes some time. It's in fact after Elizabeth's uh, lifetime that some possibility of that emerges, but there you have it. It is um, in 1583 that John Dee receives an invitation to Bohemia by a Czech nobleman. Um, and he takes with him his uh, personal secretary and uh, medium for angelic communication, Edward Kelly. And they go on a tour in uh, Eastern Europe and in the Holy Roman Empire. And uh, did you want to add something on Kelly? Uh, no, I'll leave that to you. I think uh, you were the one who mentioned that he successfully defended himself in a duel, earless as he was, and I, I had not known that. Um, I, I just know that he was Dee's uh, scryer, much, much younger than Dee at this point, like 30 years younger. He'd lost his ears because of uh, forgery, if I'm remembering right. Um, and he had come together with D because he was known uh, for his ability to uh, converse with spirits. But um, but yeah, perhaps you can tell us more. Uh, yes, so um, uh, Edward Kelly and John D, they set up a system which is based on crystal gazing uh, and they set up communication with angels, which they note down. And uh, Kelly develops the so-called Enochian language, uh, the alphabet of the angels, with which to decipher the messages they receive from the angels and they travel through Europe. And it's um, uh, obviously <laughs> a big thing. Many people are interested in this. For instance, they had the court of Rudolf II. Uh, he is emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. He is Catholic and Habsburg. Uh, a member of the House of Habsburg, but he moved the court from, from Vienna to Prague and he was quite tolerant when it came to religion. Because he had to accommodate within his empire these very seeds of uh, discontent that were emerging. Um, I heard uh, some people mention that part of why he moved his court Prague was simply that the Turks had at that point gotten a whole lot closer. Um, but there were probably uh, other reasons uh, as well. And for, for whatever reason, um, Rudolf II welcomed uh, alchemists, uh, astronomers, astrologers, uh, many, many learned men of his day to his court. Giordano Bruno went there, Dee went there, uh, Tycho Brahe was there. Um, and so, it, yeah, his, 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 his court at, at that time, if I remember correctly, was pretty much the Mecca to use a, to strain a metaphor um, for anyone who is involved in magic or alchemy and all the rest. And I think that pissed off any number of his Habsburg relatives. And how does D fit into the Rosicrucians? Um, so in order to understand this, we need to look at his book, uh, Mona Hieroglyphica, which was published 1564. Uh, I'm just going to go through the frontispiece, the first page. And uh, here we have um, kind of an altar, and at the top is written in Latin, Qui non intelegit aut taceat aut discat. He who may those who don't understand uh, be silent I, I and walk or learn. Uh, hmm? be, be silent or learn, isn't it? Um, Takere uh, is uh, to be silent, and discut is the uh, is from discere uh, to walk away. Discedere. Huh. Go on, sir. No, go on. No, no, no. If you if you don't know, uh, you can go, uh, you can stay home. <laughs> um, and this is also uh, can be seen as an allu allusion to the Platonic Academy, because. Uh, on top of the Platonic Academy that was written, he who does not know geometry may not enter. Um, so what we see here is that you need some kind of 
uh, esoteric knowledge to work with this, to understand what this is all about. And um, are you gonna are you gonna cover the dimension or the the possible or the likely aspect of cryptography? Um, I don't have it. Uh, I will not. But uh, would you say a thing or two? Yeah, just very very quickly. Um, I, I noticed because uh, um, uh, Louis the Sixteenth put up a, a, a good quote here uh, about um, Greek and angels and the idea of uh, of them being messengers. Um, you know, so you've got the idea of conversations with angels and the Enochian tablets. Um, uh, D was connected to people uh, who were connected to uh, Trithemius of Sponheim that, uh, and Abbot of Wurzburg. Um, Trithemius wrote a book called Steganogra Steganographia, which was uh, a treatise on cryptography. Um, and it was uh, first my old friend Tim who pointed out to me back in the 90s when there were really no books suggesting it that I was aware of anyway, uh, that that um, these Enochian tablets, as well as many of these things that we see that look like magic squares and the rest were probably related to cryptography. I think in the years since, there is a strong sort of underground current of people who are inclined to believe that uh, quite a bit of D and Kelly's Enochian stuff was a cryptographic message system now that is not to say that it could not also be something that they believed about conversations with angels because as we have seen the astronomy and the alchemy lived together side by side they were not divided um the astronomy and the astrology the alchemy and the chemistry they they, they were all one thing the magical knowledge and the scientific knowledge were sort of bound up in their heart um and so what we have is a tradition of cryptography that really takes off at this time. Um, Trithemius of Sponheim, or the the the, the abbot abbot Trithemius that I mentioned, who wrote, wrote the Stegano, Steganographia, he was a good friend of Cornelius Agrippa's, very famous for his books on occult philosophy. Um, uh, D, if he didn't uh, know and correspond with um, uh, Trithemius, he certainly knew people who knew him and had. Um, and this is a, a, a period when the cryptography is incredibly important, particularly in the context of Protestant and uh, Catholic conflict. You know, we've got the Babington plot where Francis Walsingham, who perhaps we'll come across later, um, uh, you know, decodes these messages that are being sent between um, Mary or whatever and um, uh, Babington. Um, and, and she ends up being executed because she wants to take Elizabeth down and replace her with uh, Catholics. So, so D is traveling on the continent, but there are strong arguments to be made that it's not just because of his secret occult knowledge. It's also based on the idea to put together alliances because of the need of the Protestants to stand together against the, uh, the Catholic forces that are assembling against them. And um, that is very likely why he went to the court of uh, uh, Rudolf II. Um, and, and so I don't know enough about it to get into the details. Uh, I, I don't know, for example, for sure, uh, whether or not anyone has properly uh, decoded any of these works from the perspective that they are ciphers that must be uh, solved. But that must be understood in the context of this whole discussion because uh, cryptography and spy efforts are uh, definitely a part of this story. In case this Nokian language was actually only for cryptographic purposes, this would have been an elaborate scheme. Because as Dean notes in his diaries, Edward Kelly in a session tells him all right, the angels have decided. We have to share our wives. And he notes down, yes, I did it. If the angels say so, I have to do it. I don't know what his wife said about this, but... <laughs> well, apparently um, they did it. There's a son that he had when he got back to... Um, I think it was when he got back to uh, England, but that, that's that big age difference between them. They apparently did, or so it is said, that they did exchange their wives and a son was born to D. Um, and he was in his 60s when the, the child was born. So it's at least possible that um, 
if not likely, that they did indeed uh, exchange wives. Uh, D, as I understood it, saw it as a test for him to set certain things aside and to pursue the course laid out for him by the angels. Um, I, I do not believe that um, Enochian magic was, uh, or the system was only for cryptography, which is why I went into that business about, you know, the alchemy is the chemistry, the astrology is the astronomy. Um, it could be that it was used as cryptography and at the same time was something that uh, D devoutly believed in and as a system as well. But as soon as you start seeing big tables of letters, I mean, to me, it just looks like a primitive form of a of an enigma machine, you know. I think you're you're muted still, Mateus. Uh, my bad. Um, D was of the opinion that his new symbol, the Monas Hieroglyphica, which we see here was the answer to all questions. It would unravel all the mysteries of science and of religion. Um, now, let's break it down as good as I can. The point in the middle symbolizes the Earth. The circle around is the Sun. The crescent on top is the Moon. The cross uh, could be the four elements, could be the trinity. At the bottom, you have the sign of Aries of the zodiac. Uh, it's also, it, parts of this symbol can also be the alchemical symbol of Mercury. So, what we have here is uh, this is like esotericism and exotericism. D publishes this book, but then what are you going to do with it? You don't understand it. So in um, in the research on D, uh, a lot of researchers say, okay, al alchemy was a normal, a secretive tradition, and you needed this context, you needed this knowledge to understand those works, and we lost this tradition. And Another thing is, for instance, if you read Rudolf Steiner, then uh, Steiner will stress that every mystery school first prepares the candidate, uh, uh, pr prepares his moral capacities, and then through meditation, um, the student develops faculties with which he can access the transcendental world. And then comes initiation, where the student is initiated into the mysteries and a secret script is revealed to him. And with this script, he is able to walk around in this spiritual world to access higher beings and whatever. And we, we see this in D with Kelly, with the alphabet. And I would suspect that in order to understand this symbol, you would have to initiate it in through some kind of, and you have, would have to be initiated into some kind of mysteries, I would suppose. So I, I, I would agree. I actually have a facsimile of that with the same cover that you're pointing to there. And I just went prior to our stream today and went to look for it again, because I've, I've read it a couple of times. Um, and and it's, been, it's been probably 10 years since the last time I read it, at, at least. Um, so, you know, don't beat me up if, uh, if, I, if I'm wrong about it. But as I recall, um, his description of that figure is the idea that it acts as a kind of universal um, key. It certainly has the idea of microcosm and macrocosm inherent in it. You can see that it's within an egg-shaped diagram, which um, is probably an intentional uh, echo of the idea of, uh, of the Orphic egg of the soul. But by the same token, because of that universal harmony between the inside and the outside, that which is above and that which is below, the idea of, again, macrocosm and microcosm, it stands for both the, the soul as well as all of the things out here in manifestation in the, the wider world. Um, but as I recall, the diagram is uh, Pythagorean. It's also geometric. Um, and in many respects, for those who know about such things, I think it is one of the things that Crowley ripped off 
in his uh, thing that he calls the Naples arrangement in his uh, Book of Thoth, which is the idea of the point and the extension, the moving from uh, nothingness to a single dimension to two dimensions to three dimensions. Um, I think it goes further than uh, Crowley's Naples arrangement idea does. Um, but there is certainly that dimension of it uh, as well, since D was a mathematician uh, and was famous for his uh, introduction to uh, Euclid's elements of geometry. He was, you know, uh, skilled in navigation. Um, and, and, and so this was seen to be a kind of universal key that if understood would reveal the secrets of nature, both inner uh, and outer. The only other thing I can remember from the book, and I never had the time to properly look into it. It's very small. It's a short book, which is why I was pissed I couldn't find it because I wanted to read it again. Um, there's some very odd things going on with the punctuation in it as well um, that suggests that there may well be some cryptography going on with the text of it itself that you would have to know how to... Um, how to read. There are a couple places in it where he, you know, he has the thing about, you know, uh, learn or, or, or go home or stay at home or whatever. But there's also a particular line in it that's quite good where he talks about, um, I think it's a line from scripture. And they talk about uh, offering up the choicest lettuces to the asses um, when thistles would be more appropriate for them. So, you know, he, he sort of openly says that this text has things hidden in it that you need to know how to see. And it's not just that diagram. I think it probably has something to do with the text itself containing a, a second text. But that is sheer speculation. Uh, and that's probably enough of that. What is also very interesting about the book is that if you look at the frontispiece again, we see Maximilianum de Grazia Romanorum Bohemia et Hungariae Regem Sapientissimo, um, dedicated to Maximilian the uh, First by God's grace, uh, Roman Emperor, King of Bohemia and Hungary, um, most knowledgeable king, and Maximilian. So, so he's he's one. Uh, emperor before, or two emperors before Rudolf? Or something like that? I think about two emperors before Rudolf, maybe. Um, but also of the House of Habsburg, and he's a Catholic. So we, we kind of see that during this time it's a little bit more fluid. Um, the uh, boundaries will get much sharper during the Thirty Years' War. Um, and this is where we're going to go now. Um, uh, now we're going to jump to the Rosicrucian Manifestos. All righty. Um, the Rosicrucian Manifestos, there were three of them. They were published from 1614 to 1616. Um, but before they were published, there were manuscripts circulating and people, some people knew, knew very well that uh, these manuscripts existed. And one of those persons was Adam Haselmeier. Um, unfortunately, uh, I was unable to find an image of him. Um, but anyway, he publishes in 1612 the first printed book that talks about the Rosicrucians, an answer to the Pharma Fraternitatis. Um, and we'll get to this in a minute. Uh, first about Adam Haselmeier. He was a Paracelsian, surprise, surprise. Um, and he uh, <clears throat> published works on Paracelsus where he talks of a Santa Theophrastia, a sacred, uh, sacred Theophrastianism, <laughs> because one of the names of Paracelsus was Theophrastus. Um, anyways, he was uh, ousted from his position as Latin teacher at a monastic school in Bolzano. Um, Bolzano is in the northern parts of Italy. And he was uh, kicked out of the school because he defended the ideas of Paracelsus. Um, he then had to work as an alchemist, as a physician and translator. And he engages in polemic discussions with 
a local physician called Hippolytus Guarinonius. Um, this Hippolytus was educated by Jesuits and an ardent counter-reformator. Uh, um, and uh, Haselmeier calls this Hippolytus a Kleister practitioner and a pill peddler in one of his writings. And he says that we don't need Aristotle, we don't need Galen, all we need is the Bible. This is all we need. Um, so Haselmeier is one of the more extreme examples of a Rosicrucian who says we can get rid of all the antique, all the knowledge of antiquity. We only need the Bible and the book of nature going out into nature and uh, doing experiments. This is all we need. Yes, and in 1612, he publishes a so-called, and I translate the frontispiece, answer to the laudable fraternity uh, of the Theosophers of the Rose Cross by Adam Haselmeier. Oh God, he put his name on there. He's going to get into big trouble now. Um, because his rival, Hippolytus Guarinonius, uh, whom we already mentioned, denounces him with the authorities for publishing this subversive text. And now Adam Haselmeier approaches the Archduke of Austria, uh, who is the ruler of Bolzano. This is Maximilian III, and he's also a member of the House of Habsburg. They are everywhere. Okay, he approaches uh, the Archduke, and he gives him a petition. And he says that, yeah, he published this uh, work, and now people don't like him, and he would like to have permission to leave, and he would like to have some travel money to go to Montpellier to look for some members of the Rosicrucians. Um, well, he receives his travel money, but with a rather different destination. Uh, Maximilian has already signed the arrest warrant and Adam Haselmeier is sent off to the galleys for four years. He survives and he comes back. Usually when you're sent to the galleys, you're done for. You die. It's too tough. But he survives four years and comes back. Now, from this we can already see how suspicious, how subversive the Rosicrucian manifestos are. And Adam Haselmeier is interrogated uh, during his arrest by Augustinian monks and by the Jesuits. Where do these uh, manuscripts come from? Who is in possession of them? They want to know it. They want to know this. And finally, we have Augustus of Anhalt. So what is this prince doing here? Well, it was in the printing office, in the secret printing office of Augustus of Anhalt that this answer to the farmer was printed. And uh, maybe some hundred books were printed and they were disseminated in secret. But here we see that there is a prince willing to publish these manifestos. And this prince has a half-brother who will later become the military leader of the Protestant Union. So we can already see the boundaries. Uh, Paracelsians, Protestants, Rosicrucians on the one side, and on the other side, you have the Pope, the Jesuits, the House of Habsburg, Catholics. And let's go to the first Rosicrucian manifesto, the Fama Fraternitatis. And this answer, which I've just mentioned, is an answer to the Fama Fraternitatis. 
but the Pharma Fraternitatis was only uh, published in 1614. Now, this is the first manifesto, and we could call it the political, uh, the philosophical manifesto of the Rosicrucians. I'm going to take you through the frontispiece. So here it says, universal and general reformation of the whole wide world. So reformation, of course, is associated with Protestantism. Also, the Pharma Fraternitatis. Pharma in this case, case means revelation, making something known. The revelation of the fraternity. Of the laudable order of the Rose Cross. Written to all learned to, uh, to all learned and rulers of Europe. Also, a short answer by Mr. Haselmeier, for which he, Haselmeier, has been incarcerated by the Jesuits and sent to the galleys. This very Haselmeier. So, Haselmeier is, so to speak, um, the first, um, how do you say, martyr of the Rosicrucians. And now this is highly interesting. At the bottom, there is information on where it is published. At the bottom, printed in Kassel by Wilhelm Wessel in the year of 1614. So the publisher is Wilhelm Wessel. Who is Wilhelm Wessel? Wilhelm Wessel is the court printer of Maurice of Kassel. So this manifesto was printed and published on the order of Maurice of Kassel. A and, what we, and what do we know about him? Yes. We know about him that he joined the Protestant Union, which was led by Frederick V. Um, so from this it is quite clear. We have some Protestant princes in the Holy Roman Empire who are pushing Rosicrucianism, just like Cosimo de' Medici was pushing uh, Neoplatonism. And with this context at hand, now let's go into the content of the first manifesto. So the uh, manifesto of the pharma uses the analogy of microcosm, macrocosm. Man is a microcosm and the world is the macrocosm. The same analogy was used by Paracelsus. The pharma talks about the Librum Naturae, the book of nature, from which the members of this secret society take their knowledge. Now, Paracelsus used the same metaphor in his books. For instance, um, I'm just going to go back to him here, yeah, Paracelsus. Paracelsus in his seven defenses says that the Good physician is a student of the Codex Naturae, the book of nature. And the same metaphor is used here. And the farmer then says that we can take all the knowledge from the book of nature, but still the established authorities cling to the, I quote, old teaching of the Pope Aristotle and Galil. Uh, Paracelsus uh, would have agreed. Now, uh, let's talk about the mythical, the legendary founder of the Rosicrucians. And I must point out here that their founder, Christian Rosenkreuz, Christian Rose Cross, is not a real person. If he has existed, 
he existed under a different name. Uh, research has not identified this Christian Rosenkreuz. Okay, so according to the manifesto, he was born in 1386 and he lived for 106 years until 1483. Um, he became a monk and then he went on a tour to the Holy Land, to Jerusalem. But there was an accident and he ended up in Damascus where he learned Arab, Arabic, maths and physics. Later he went to Fez where he was introduced to mystic societies, mystic Arab societies, and he learned Kabbalah and magic. And he also learned about the Transmutatione Metallorum, about the transmutation of metals. He could make gold, no problem, but he wouldn't do it uh, for because he had better stuff. Uh, he was interested in the perfection of the soul and not of riches and not in riches. So with all this great knowledge, he goes back to Europe and he finds that the establishment has no interest in him, neither the uh, establishment at the universities nor the rulers, just like Paracelsus, who was not really understood during his lifetime. So he returns to Germany and he founds the secret society of the Rose Cross with three monks, with three brothers of his former monastery. And then they take in four more brothers. So there are eight members. And they set up a headquarters, which they call the House of the Holy Spirit. There they engage in alchemic research and they heal the sick. And then they decide, and they also set up a magical script, quote, magische Schrift. And here I can refer again to Rudolf Steiner. Rudolf Steiner thought of himself as continuing the Rosicrucian tradition. And Rudolf Steiner stresses that every mystical organization will have a secret, a magical script. And this is exactly like John Dee and Edward Kelly. They need this Enochian script to communicate with the angels. And also in this secret society of the Rose Cross, a magical script. It is for communication with higher beings. Of course, we don't, yeah, we the historical uh, reality of the Christian Rosenkreuz has never been uh, established, but certainly everybody believed, or many believed, certainly Jesuits believed, because they torture you to try to find out, um, they believed that there was a society of the Rosy Cross and that they could get in touch with it. I mean, I, I do recall that any number of people were trying to write letters or to publish books saying, come find me, you know, they're they sent their agents to different European cities to say, see if you can figure out where they are, we're interested, right? So it's been described after the fact as a kind of hoax. And I, 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 I'm, uh, if I remember correctly, you're gonna talk about Johann Valentin Andre, right? Um, but but um, it doesn't, uh, we don't know exactly what it was. We don't know exactly what this what this book was all about. But yes, it does seem as though they, they needed a magical script of their own as well. Yes, it seems that uh, what is written in this uh, in these manifestos is probably um, a myth. It's a narration that is that was needed to push society in a certain direction. Um, but of course, um, embedded into an alchemical magical context where people were practicing these things that are talked about in this in these manifestos or people would at least be very interested in learning more about these things and what was the date of the publication of the Six, alchemical work? 1614 so that's two i think that's two years before James of England gave his daughter to Frederick the Elector. 
Exactly. I think they married in 1616, somewhere right in there. And then they reign from 1616 to 1621 when they get crushed at the Battle of White Mountain. So I know that you know this, Anteus, but for our viewers, this is a point at which it seems possible for many that there could be some new renaissance of a, of a utopian Protestant kind um, and that it would come to pass because of an alliance between um, Britain and uh, and Frederick the Elector. Now, I, I mean, even at the time, people are like, are you crazy? This is, I mean, you got to remember that it's all, or many of the Habsburgs are against you, right? And and other countries, I mean, certainly the, the, the Papal State, yeah, um, you know, all kinds of Catholic countries are like, you know, not just no, but hell no. Um, but for some reason, these Protestants believe that they had a real shot in the future at bringing this utopian world to life. And so you cannot separate this text from um, this situation at this very specific time, which was the idea that some sort of uh, um, reimagining, you know, they, they, they were getting ready to build back better. Um, and, uh, and, and, and for a short time, it seemed possible to everyone that it could happen. But by, by the Battle of White Mountain, 1620, 1621, somewhere right in there, um, the 30 years began. And of course, I mean, the 30 years was primarily fought on German soil and it was absolutely shattered and, and just fucked for decades. But sorry, go on. Absolutely right. They were in high hopes. And they were winning the mediatic warfare at this moment with the publication of this manifesto and the other ones. Um, it's like an avalanche running over Europe. You have uh, hundreds of thousands of responses, printed manuscripts, admonitions, um, comments on the Rosicrucians, people saying they want to join the order, they say it's a good idea, people criticizing it. It's all over the place. Um, if we compare, we, we could maybe compare to COVID. I mean, of course, the media was not so developed back in those days, but for a few years, the Rosicrucians were really all over the place. Um, in Europe, and a lot of people were highly enthusiastic about it. So, going back to the content, now you could uh, maybe compare. You could maybe compare it more accurately to a uh, Q. You know, everyone was like, uh, you know, we're going to be saved. Trust the plan. You know, there there are people secretly working behind the scenes who are elite who are going to ensure that uh, that that Trump will stay in power and that you know. Um, will will empty out the underground prisons and release the pedophile captives and mm -hmm. and you know bring in new types of uh, banking that will make it impossible for the former power structures to remain in place. It really was there was a there was a Rosicrucian mania for several years there all over Europe. Yeah. Delusion comes before the train wreck. Um, so. Uh, Christian Rosenkreuz then decides to uh, disperse all the members around Europe so that the ideas can slowly uh, be disseminated um, into Europe. And the order, the secret society, gives themselves six rules. So the first one is you have to heal the sick for free. Second, wear no distinct dresses and adopt local customs. Third, annual meetings at the headquarters. Four, every member has to find a successor to replace him after death. Five, use the name RC as seal and code word. So RC, probably Rosenkreuz Christian, just a family name and surname. And rule six, secrecy for 100 years. So only after 100 years are they going to reveal to the public their existence. Sounds a lot like a, kind of a long march through the institutions, doesn't it? Um, I haven't thought about it this way. Yes, 
Um, but today things work faster. Huh? I think the last march through the institutions just took a generation. Well, yeah, but they didn't have telephones back in the day of Christian Rosenkreutz. They didn't have uh, jet airplanes. Yeah. Yeah. So if, so if we get down, it uh, should take us uh, maybe uh, two months. Huh? Um, all right. Um, so this is it about the first Rosicrucian Manifesto. And let's go to the Confessio. Um, you see that the person on the left, Maurice of Kassel, is still the same. This is for the very simple fact that also this Rosicrucian Manifesto was printed in Kassel. And we could call it the political manifesto. The first one was much more about changing the way people investigate how they think about nature, uh, how they think about medicine. Now, this manifesto is much more about politics. Let's go through the frontispiece. So, it's, it, this one is a Latin. Uh, Secretioris Philosophiae Considerato Brevis, um, so short consideration of secret philosophy. Filippo, Filippo Agabella, this is a pseudonym. Uh, research has not yet discovered the person behind Filippo Agabella. So let's just consider this an anonymous publication. Um, Confessione Fraternitatis Rosa Cruce in Lucem Edita. Uh, confession of the Fraternity of the Rose Cross uh, made public, brought to light. And here again, uh, Casselis, this is the Latinized name of Cassel. Uh, Gielmus Veselius, the court printer of Maurice of Cassel. And now this confession, this manifesto is much more radical in its use of language. So the Pope is called the, quote, Antichrist. Um, this is, of course, a millenarian uh, word because it evokes the book of Revelation. Uh, in the book of Revelation, there's the final battle between good and evil, between the forces of light and dark, between Satan and God. And yes, the end is near. Um, great things are about to happen. A lot of people believe that the end is near at that time um, because the last supernova that was visible with the human eye in our universe took place in 1604. 10 years before the pub, 11 years before the publication of this manuscript, of this um, uh, confession. And a lot of people uh, wondered what this supernova was about because it was so bright. It was brighter at times than Jupiter. People thought, there is an eighth star. What is going on here? Um, yes, so um, this is something that they allude to. And uh, in the confession they write, uh, the, the occurrence of the star shows that great things are about to occur, about to happen. And the confession then says that in, in order to achieve this goal, there are still a lot of eagle feathers in the way. So the feathers of an eagle are in the way. And research interprets this as an allusion to the House of Habsburg. Because the heraldic beast of the House of Habsburg is the eagle. So the program is quite clear. We have to get rid of the anti Antichrist, the Pope, and we have, get, have to get rid of the eagle of the House of Habsburg, the Emperor, the Holy Roman Emperor. And I give another quote. Until the line cometh, demandeth, and receiveth the treasures for the fortification of his empire. So um, what is this line about that is, that is about to 
fortify his empire? Is it as Francis Yates uh, suspects Frederick V? Frederick V, the leader of the Protestant Union, whose heraldic beast is the lion? Could be. It could also be the biblical line of the book of Revelation, who opens the book with the seven seals and who is also seen as a symbol for Jesus Christ. Anyways, I would say both interpretations make sense. And um, a really great work like the Mona Lisa is... Uh, one property of a really great work, be it a book, be it a work of art, is ambiguity. People can see whatever they want in it. Um, and so I think it is here with the Rosicrucian manifestos um, that different people can get different meanings from these works. But definitely for people who are not uh, familiar with the context, again, you have to understand that there is really a titanic struggle unfolding across Europe. I mean, and uh, the, the Habsburgs versus the Protestants, this, this, is, this is as real as anything gets. I mean, just a short time before all this, uh, not much time at all. I mean, what, 20, 25 years, um, the Spanish had tried to take um, uh, Britain, um, certainly England. You know, they had uh, sailed with the Spanish Armada and tried to defeat the English and had been um, trounced. And at that point, Britain really appeared as a as a, 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 a power to be reckoned with in Europe. Um, and obviously their navies uh, grew stronger. I mean, the, the wealth of the Habsburg, the territory they controlled, uh, the, you know, the various family branches, it was just absolutely enormous. And, you know, there had been all kinds of... Um, fighting that had broken out previously as regards, um, you know, the, the business with the Reformation. And you, you have a situation where uh, the Holy Roman Empire, the Habsburgs in the East have enormous power and they're, they're getting ready to go after the Protestants. Uh, Rudolf of Bohemia, um, Rudolf II, um, you know, Emperor, um, Habsburg Emperor, um, was trying to steer a middle course and not have everything fall apart into violence. But other members of the family were like, you know, what the hell are you doing? We need to take this territory back. We need to get rid of these heretics. We need to, uh, you know, cease dealing with these problems. Um, and in order to do that, we've, we've got to go to war. And so everyone was trying to find a way to, you know, fall into their various camps, take their positions, um, in order to um, to come out in one piece of the fight that people knew uh, was coming, and and it did come when uh, when uh, Rudolf II uh, was out, and uh, I, I can't remember the details well. It would it, we need a, a perhaps you can um, explain uh, more of it, Anteos. But as I recall, uh, Rudolf II was out, and he was going to be replaced. And a bunch of the Protestant um, electors and other nobles said, uh, no, we don't want this Habsburg guy is going to be coming in because he's going to go to war and he's going to remove our privileges and all these other things. Um, and so instead they turn around, probably thinking that he would get support from England. And they chose uh, Frederick, the Elector Palatine, who had married James of England's, uh, uh, Scotland and of England's daughter. Um, and that all went terribly. They got their asses handed to them. They were utterly smashed and that kicked off the whole 30 years war. And, and, and looking at it all as though it's one war with a number of battles, like now I no longer think of world war one and world war two as separate. They're just two different battles in a bigger war. And of course that, I'm not new in doing that. Plenty of people have thought about it that way, but now I'm increasingly looking at what's going on in Europe from the Renaissance forward, certainly from the Reformation forward, as all being the same war with different episodes. And so in some respects, I think you can see what happened with the Holy Roman Empire here in the Thirty Years' War as 
anticipating what was later done to Russia, for example, with the uh, the Russian Revolution and the rise of the Bolsheviks and the rest. You know, you see an empire being split apart by the fomenting of a new religious belief system. But anyway, everybody has to understand that the the context for this is major espionage, major preparation for war, enormous fortunes, people's power, people's life and death. This, this is all the context for this. So you can't just look at the Rosicrucians as this, this element standing all by itself. It was a, an important piece of uh, propaganda, as Anteus was saying, and it really charged up a number of the uh, Protestant princes and lords and you know wealthy elites um, with hope that something could be done here. And um, it, uh, it did not work out well for them. Or I should say, and, and, and in just a second, I'll turn it back over to Anteos because he may have some thoughts on this. Let us put it this way. It did not work out well for this particular group of the Protestants who had the vision <clears throat> of the utopian future with alchemy and hermeticism and the rest. There were other groups that did fairly well out of it, and a, a, much of the Habsburg power uh, was smashed. And at the end of this 30 years war process, you see the Treaty of Westphalia, and you see the idea of the nation state, or the idea at least of a nation state and an international order coming to the fore. So you could say that certain groups were successful over this period against the Habsburgs in the East, um, in terms of limiting their power and reducing their dominion um, and, and moving the Protestants forward. But certainly the group centered around the Rosicrucians, um, they got their asses handed to them, at least in the beginning, and got slapped around badly. And uh, perhaps we'll see uh, different aspects of this as we go forward in this series, looking at later developments. But it may be that, um, you know, they were forced to reassess and come from a slightly different direction. But it sure is interesting that after the 30 years war, it's not long before France is shattered. You know, it does seem like they move from power block to power block, you know, according to this hypothesis, you know, smash the Holy Roman Empire, smash the, smash the French um, kingdom, you know, eventually smash the Russians. But anyway, that's, that, those are my, my winding thoughts. But what would be the um, uniting element between the forces that smash the Holy Roman Empire, uh, France and Russia? Well, you certainly don't have, um, you know, just one group involved in something as complicated and uh, something that took so much time as the, the Thirty Years' War. You can't say that there's just one group behind it, but certainly we see that it was the Elector Palatine and these utopian um, visionaries who had an idea of a future um, based on these esoteric ideas and hermeticism, as well as strange aspects of Protestantism. They're the ones who literally kicked off the Thirty Years' War with um, uh, Frederick trying to take over the kingdom of Bohemia. Um, and they were allied to the damn Anglos. And so now let's go to the French. Take a look at um, Jacobin clubs running in London and um, Masonic orders, which are sort of an analog for Rosicrucians, right? And the idea of Enlightenment utopians who um, certainly have, as I said, Jacobin clubs in London coming over with their 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 visions of a, how a future society should be organized and um, kicking off all kinds of trouble in France. Um, when you turn to the Russian Empire, um, I, I certainly can't say that the Bolsheviks are, um, are uh, you know, organized like Freemasons are, but they're, they've got, they're in revolutionary cells and they learned the lessons of 48 and 1905. And so they operate in secret and they certainly have a utopian vision for the future. Um, we're left with the question, though, of whether or not they can be called religious, which is, you know, is a, probably a bridge too far. And I'm, I'm not claiming any of this is reality. But, you know, when you look at the span of time, it's at least sometimes entertaining to uh, to say, I'm, I wonder if there could be continuity here. 
Unfortunately, I just forgot the name of a book which uh, goes, in a, goes in a similar direction and it argues that all those revolutionary movements, the French revolutionaries, the Russian revolutionaries, they use this notion of light and darkness, of the flame, the revolutionary flame. Um, and weren't you talking and... earlier about about how uh, Ficino and his uh, Villa at Careggi he kept a flame lit to Plato that was never allowed to go out? And yeah. there is the the Manichaean idea of light and darkness, which is very you know very much a dialectic, and so you get the idea of light and darkness base dualism um, is is certainly a theme with uh, a lot of these uh, revolutionary movements because it's easy to paint it as black and white, good and evil, you know, the forces of good must triumph. And even if the, even if the commies can't properly be called religious in the sense of any transcendental aspect, they elevate their flatness, their dialectic to the level of a, of a religion. And it's a Manichaean one because they worship a dialectic, you know. Uh, it is. So, yeah, I think uh, we can go to the last uh, manifesto. And that's the, this is the chemical wedding of Adam Weishaupt. <laughs> Freudian slip of Christian Rosenkreuz. Um, all righty. Uh, now, this one is uh, written by Johann Valentin Andrei, uh, whom you already mentioned. Uh, and note that date of 1616. Let me just double check on that and make sure that I got this. What is it, Elizabeth? Sorry. Yes, it is. It is 1616. I'm quite sure. Was there was there wedding? Yeah. Okay. And uh, it is um, quite undisputed in research that Andrea was the author of the last manifesto. Um, although his name does not appear on the publication. It was published anonymously. And sorry, wedding was, sorry, wedding was uh, 14th of February, 1613. Uh, come again. Uh, it was uh, the wedding to the, the marriage between Elizabeth and Frederick was actually 1613. For some reason I had 1616 ah. in my head. Okay. But anyway, th it doesn't matter that much. I just wanted to correct it since I was wrong. Okay, I'm just going to go through the frontispiece. Uh, chemical wedding of Christian Rosenkreuz in the year 1459. So at this moment, he is 72 years old, according to the legend. Then there is some Latin. <laughs> and at the bottom, Strasbourg. It was published in Strasbourg. This is interesting. Uh, the two other manifestos were published in principalities. Moritz of Kassel and Augustus of Anhalt. Now we have a manifesto published in a free imperial city. Uh, from this, we already see that the power structure in the Holy Roman Empire is different than the power structure in Italy. In Italy, the Florentine Renaissance is driven solely by cities like Florence and Venice. In the Holy Roman Empire, the princes and the kings seem more influential. Okay, now um, the chemical wedding is something of a fairy tale, a fairy tale. Um, where Christian Rosenkreuz is invited to a royal wedding. And it begins with uh, Rosenkreuz sitting at a table and praying to God. And then a strong wind appears and he thinks, he thinks the roof is going to blow off. Um, but he remains in his, quote, meditation. So meditation is used for prayer or for meditation. This is quite interesting that it is used in this sense here, not just thinking, reflecting, but really meditating as we would uh, see it today in Buddhism and Hinduism, as we would understand it today. 
and a beautiful virgin arrives and invites him to a wedding. And he, uh, he before we talk about the wedding, let's talk about this third page of the book, which is right here. Um, and I'm going to give the English translation of this poem by Francis Yates. This day, this day, this, this, the royal wedding is, art thou thereto by birth inclined, and unto joy of God designed? Then mayst thou to the mountain tent, whereon three stately temples stand, and there see all from end to end. Now this is the poem, which invites Rosenkreuz to the wedding. What do we have on the margin? Uh, Semigog, what do you think is that? What could that be? That is the uh, Monas Hieroglyphica, the Hieroglyphic Monad. It is. Let's go back. Yes, it is. Undoubtedly. How did it get there? Um, well, uh, Francis Yates um, argues that the presence of the Monas Hieroglyphica uh, explains that the secret philosophy of the Rosicrucians was based on John Dee. Um, this is uh, disputed in research. There are other researchers who think no, uh, it was all it all came from per Paracelsus. Maybe maybe okay, they took this Monas. But uh, the real philosophy, th this came from Paracelsus. These are the two theories here. Um, then uh, there is a line inside the castle uh, where the wedding takes place. And uh, Francis Yates um, thinks, of course, this is an allusion to Frederick V. Uh, Rosenkreuz is actually invited to the castle of Frederick V. This is what's going on here. This is what Francis Yates thinks. Uh, Carlos Gilli, um, on the other hand, uh, thinks that the line in the garden, uh, the line in the castle is the biblical line who opens the uh, book of seven seals of the book of Revelation of the apocalypse. And Rosenkreuz uh, spent uh, some time at this castle. Um, a lot of strange things happen. They practice alchemy. They make experiments. People die. People are brought back uh, from the dead. And in the end, Rosenkreuz and the other guests are invited to join the Knights of the Golden Stone. Um, and the Knights of the Golden Stone wear a dress which is white and a red cross on it. And again, Francis Yates thinks that this is an allusion to uh, the Order of the Garter. The Order of the Garter was the, this is the highest uh, order of chivalry in England. And Frederick V was initiated to this order uh, during his wedding with specifically because he was married to Elizabeth, the daughter of the king. Yeah. Which was in 1613, as we have learned. And so for Francis Yates, the uh, origins of the Rosicrucians come from England, come from John Dee, her countryman. Uh, Francis Yates is uh, probably the most important historian on the Rosicrucians. Um, and she presents a explanation which is really centered on England. Um, but it's important to point out that they needn't be mutually exclusive. There could be the influence of uh, Theophrastus von Bastus von Hohenheim, uh, as well as uh, D. This could be the case. Um, and then there's this, uh, as you said, uh, there's another group of historians around uh, Carlos Gilli, German historians, uh, who argue, no, it's uh, John Dee was not really important. It's all about Paracelsus. 
It is all German, ja. It is not oh, ja. This Angles, Anglos. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, but um, anyway, um, I'm not here to um, uh, call the shots on this in the end. Uh, I would have to do tons of research. Are we still scratching at the surface only? So we let it uh, stay as it is. And yeah, let's uh, uh, move to uh, Frederick V, the Winter King. Um, now, this is actually um, a marvelous painting and that I'm going to talk about at the end of this uh, show. It is in the uh, Kurpfälzische Museum, in the uh, Museum of the Palatinate. Uh, you can it was, visit it, it was in done, Heidelberg. It was done later, wasn't it? Like after he was mm -hmm. uh, exiled? It's uh, posthumous, posthumously, yes. And I stood in front of it in the Museum of Heidelberg. It's a nice, very nice painting. There are also paintings of Luther. Oh, all those uh, Protestants in this museum. Um, yes. Uh, Frederick V is the leader, uh, is the um, elector of the Palatinate. Let's have a look at the map. Um, if you look at my mouse cursor and you see these... Uh, greenish parts. This is the Palatinate. It is rather small compared to the Habsburgs who are in yellow and who control huge swaths of the Roman of the Holy Roman Empire on the south and on the east, on the west, the Austrian Netherlands. And it's and probably no no accident that the southern parts of Germany, if I'm not mistaken, remain the most Catholic to this day, don't they? This is true. And also what is not on the map here is Spain. Spain is also under Austrian control, Habsburg control, and thereby 50% uh, of the new world. Okay. Let's go back to our friend Frederick. Now, he becomes the leader of the Protestant Union, which we've already mentioned. It is a defensive alliance of Protestant states and cities. And the mastermind and commander, the commander-in-chief of the Protestant Union, is Christian of Anhalt. Christian of Anhalt is the half-brother of Augustus of Anhalt, who hmm. secretly published the first book that mentions the Rosicrucians. And in the next year, the Catholic League is founded under the leadership of, uh, the, yeah, the Catholic League under the leadership of Maximilian I, Duke of Bavaria. Maximilian is also a member of the Wittelsbacher, of this, he is a member of the same house as Frederick V, but a different branch, the Catholic branch. And he is raised by, hmm, by Jesuits in Ingolstadt. Just Jesuits. Schwein. Schwein Jesuits. And Jesuits in Ingolstadt. Now, we are talking about uh, 1600. Uh, we were talking about around 1600, uh, yeah. And 176 years later, what is happening? The Illuminati are founded in Ingolstadt. And their mission is to fight the Jesuits. And they manage to kick out the Jesuits of the University of Ingolstadt for a brief period of time. They get arrested and the Jesuits move back in. But this is something we are going to talk about in a future episode. At the moment, Ingolstadt is in the hands of Jesuits. And in 1613, there's the wedding between Frederick and Elizabeth Stuart, first in London, and then they move down to Heidelberg. Uh, Heidelberg, which is somewhere here.
And yes, um, I mean, Sammy Gork, you already mentioned it. Elizabeth Stewart is the daughter of James I. Um, and Frederick V, also, he is a grandson of William the Silent. William the Silent uh, kicked out the Habsburgs. Uh, he kicked them out of the modern Netherlands. So if you look at the Dutch Republic, um, this was uh, created by William the Silent, the, gra uh, the grandfather of Frederick V, and he kicked out the Habsburgs. So the the Alembics of Spain, yes, where Philip uh, Philip Sidney died, and of course the fighting between the Habsburgs and the Dutch went on for quite some time, um, causing the Dutch in later years to have to flood their country to try to keep the keep the French out and the Spanish. Um, possibly the Spanish more uh, appropriately. But anyway, the point is that we continue to see this fighting between the Catholic Habsburg powers uh, and the Protestants. It's, it's, it's going on all over the place. And the fighting intensifies in, or the prospect of war intensifies in 1617, when Ferdinand, Ferdinand II ascends uh, the leadership of the House of Habsburg. Um, right, that's what the that's what the the disappearance of uh, uh, Rudolf the Second, right? And Ferdinand is another member of his family who thinks that the Protestants should be uh, dealt with more harshly. Am I correct? Exactly. So when Rudolf the Second ruled in Bohemia, he granted religious tolerance to Protestants and Catholics, but. Ferdinand II was of a rather different breed. He was raised by Jesuits in Ingolstadt, just like Maximilian I. And he was a strong enemy of the Reformation. Um, so what does he do? He becomes King of Bohemia and Holy Roman Emperor. And he declares Catholicism the only legitimate religion in Bohemia. He outlaws Protestantism. Um, another interesting thing, his confessor is a Jesuit. Uh, there are probably no Paracelsian physicians at his court, I would guess. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, I think probably not. And for those who don't know, I mean, most probably do. The, the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, was founded by uh, Ignatius of Loyola, who was a soldier first, before he became a priest. And after uh, uh, St. Ignatius was, I think he was struck by a cannonball in the leg or something. I mean, he was it, whatever it was, he was injured very badly. And so he meditated um, and decided that he had to uh, take holy orders and he uh, got support to found uh, the Jesuit order. Apparently Jesuits was a first, uh, um, um, uh, a negative thing about them, uh, a, a slander of them. Um, but it, it's important to understand that these Jesuits, most people will know this, but just in case you don't, they, the order was founded by an ex-soldier and they were very much, uh, they thought of themselves as the frontline warriors for Christ, whose goal was to uh, spread the Catholic word uh, far and wide and to push back against the Reformation they saw unfolding around them. I mean, to some extent, the story of the Jesuits is the story of the Counter-Reformation, so far as I understand it. It is, it is absolutely astonishing how influential the Jesuits become, how they infiltrate the highest circle of powers, or highest circles of power. Their strategy is we always strike at the head. We go to the king. We want access to the king. We, we, we don't care about here and there fiddling around. We go to the straight to the head. In China, uh, they are at the court of the emperor. Very good relations with the Chinese emperor. The same strategy in Europe. Um, and the French Revolution is, in a way, a revolt against the Jesuits and the Catholic Church. If you read the writings of the forerunners of the French Revolution, uh, Denis Diderot, Voltaire. They also used a code word. Um, 
for the Jesuits and for the Catholic Church, and they hated it. And Voltaire uh, was educated, and uh, Rousseau was. They were educated by Jesuits, but at this time something happened. Being educated by Jesuits made you the staunchest anti-Jesuit, but we're not here yet. The Jesuits are still highly effective. Um, and they will win this war. Um, so, how does the Thirty Years' War start? Um, after, the, after Ferdinand II, the Holy Roman Emperor, Catholic, Habsburg, revokes the religious freedoms of Protestants in Bohemia. Bohemian noblemen storm the castle of Prague and they throw the vice regents of Ferdinand out of the window. They fall down 17 meters uh, and they land on a dung heap. They survive. Um, yes, but this kicks off civil war in Bohemia. And this is the start of the Thirty Years' War. And now the noblemen in Bohemia, they invite Frederick V, the leader of the Protestant Union, to come from the Kurpfalz, from the Palatinate, to Bohemia and be crowned King of Bohemia. And uh, I need to tell you something about how the constitution of the Holy Roman Empire works, because this is absolutely crucial. Um, in the Holy Roman Empire, there are seven so-called electors who elect the king of the Holy Roman Empire. This king can later become emperor uh, with the consent of the Pope. But these seven electors elect the king. Three of them are clergymen. They are the archbishops of Mainz, Cologne and Trier, round about here, this region. And then there are the four secular electors, the king of Bohemia, who is Habsburg, very convenient. He will always vote for himself. The King of Bohemia, the Elector of Saxony, the Elector of Brandenburg, and the Elector of the Palatinate. And what will happen now? Now, Frederick V becomes King of Bohemia and he has two votes. Two votes. Now, this means that the Protestant have four votes. And the next king is going to be a Protestant. It's going to be Frederick V. This is what's going to happen. At which point Ferdinand says, not just no, but hell no. Uh, he, he, he won't have it. And yes, uh, so um, imperial forces um, invade Bohemia or reclaim Bohemia. And in 1620, um, there is a crushing defeat to the Pot Protestant Union uh, at the battle at the White Mountain uh, near Prague. And uh, the Protestant uh, troops are led by whom? By Christian of Anhalt. Again, by the half-brother of the prince who secretly published the first book on the Rosicrucians. And if, if I may, can I, can I just um, jump in here uh, very quickly? There's, there's additional material that was being printed at this time. We, we touched on this subject of, uh, of, of the sort of Rosicrucian mania that swept uh, across Europe. And we touched on the subject of uh, these different pamphlets that were published and the chemical wedding and the rest. But there were also uh, these. This is from um, the, I'm sorry, I'm just going to make the screen big for a moment, uh, Anteo, so you can see it. This is uh, published by uh, Stanislaus uh, Klosowski de Rola, uh, a, a famous uh, 
of a famous noble family. I have one of the older hardback editions of the Golden Game, but you can see here, there are tons of these that come out during this period. This is a collection of some of these uh, publications from the time. So you can see it's called Kabbalah, it's from 1616. And they're collections of these copper plate engravings that have all kinds of alchemical and magical symbolism, but it's also um, symbolism that can be anti-Catholic. So you see over on the right here, this is some sort of a beast wearing uh, some sort of e ecclesiastical headgear. Yeah, it looks um, like a pope. Yeah, so it's, it doesn't seem to be pro-Catholic, pro does it? And you can see um, odd sort of stuff here that uh, looks like a caduceus, but it's getting um, rather similar to a monus, uh, a, a hieroglyphic monad. And there's, there's lots of this imagery that shows these, you know, it's got astrological um, stuff in it as well. But I just wanted to show you just a few of these. This is 1614 by Michael Meyer, 1616, 1617. Um, not Michael Myers, I have to say. I'm sorry, not Mike not, Myers. No. Not, not, not Michael Myers. Michael Meyer, no S. Yes. This, this one. It's Michael Myers, uh, Atlanta Fugians, and there are uh, collections of these emblems. And what's interesting about them, this is one of the reasons I wanted to bring these up. They're all being published around this time. Um, and they start with uh, symbolism. So you've got this idea of being raised um, at the breast of Mother Nature and the idea that it's enough if people um, understand nature itself, which gives rise to them. But then they have a series of these emblems, like the idea of washing the things in order to clean them. There's all kinds of hidden uh, alchemical symbolism in it. You know, you've got the idea of a, a toad uh, suckling at the breast of a woman. You've got, you know, the image of marriages. Um, and there's all kinds of this symbolism, the idea of a, a bird leaving its nest, as you can see over uh, here. You've got the idea of sowing seeds, the idea of how you cut uh, an egg with a sword. They're all very cryptic, all very uh, rather difficult to understand, um, and all uh, very alchemical in a number of respects. Um, but these publications are coming out of Protestant lands. They're copper plate engraving. They've got heavy alchemical symbolism, heavy pagan symbolism. Uh, the image of things like andro androgynous stuff or the, her the hermaphrodites, the, the marriage of the masculine and feminine elements. And this, to, uh, to Anteos's point from earlier, has quite a bit to do with this idea of taking control of the media at the time in order to um, spread a message. Let's see, I'll just show you one last one of these because some of them are interesting insofar as what they show with the idea of separating matter. It might be hard for me to find it. Let me see if one of the Michael Meyer ones has it. No, I, w I won't go. Let me see if I've got one with a hieroglyphic monad. No, that'll probably be enough for now, but just to, I'll show you. Yeah, here's one that's important. That's what I was looking for, which let me find the name and date on this. This is from uh, Johann Daniel Milius's Opus Medico Chimicum, 1618. And you will see that a portion of it is quite a large work, with tons of plates. But one of them shows this idea of this sort of original thing that you have here with the uh, uh, of uh, the, the name of God. And you can see how it's a trinity and you've got the black and the white and then the darkness with the light in it and how it uh, resolves into darkness in the center surrounded by light. And there's a sequence of changes that are indicated. Now this can have sort of a, a mystical um, uh, aspect to it in the sense that uh, you know, there's a transformation of, of opposites, their conjunction, um, this sort of thing. And on one level, you can view that text as talking about things that are strictly uh, mystical or magical transformations that an individual will uh, undergo if uh, he or she follows this mystical path. But at the same time, you could also argue that these odd emblems and the rest 
you could argue at least the possibility that they contain um, knowledge and teachings that have to do with political power and manipulations and agitation and all the rest. So you've got the idea that, you know, just looking at that sequence that I showed you with the light and the darkness and how they transform into each other. I, I mean, that, that seems like a seed form of communist dialectics or at least a potential seed form of it that could get carried forward uh, through time. Um, so I'm not saying that's definitely the case, um, but there, there, that's one thing I wanted to point out there. And the other thing I wanted to point out was just to show you guys some samples, like Theodore de Bry was another guy who was producing a lot of these uh, publications, uh, the copper plate engravings necessary to produce the images. Um, so it, at the same time that you're seeing all the stuff going on with the, uh, the chemical wedding and the rest and those books being published, there was, they were turning out all of these mystical texts with these um, very opaque emblems that are difficult to understand uh, at present. Sorry, just a little parenthesis there on Thank you for your patience. Uh, yeah. Thanks for um, those very interesting um, uh, images. Um, I, I must say, I also have a lot of books um, that are full of uh, those alchemical images and it's really hard for us today to wrap our heads around this. Um, I mean, probably even for most people living at the time that were looking at this, what, what the hell is this supposed to mean? It might very well be that most of these images could only be understood by an initiated few who were initiated into the secrets of alchemy or mystic societies or whatever. Well, one of the things I think uh, that at least I found in it is that the, many of them appear to be illustrations that play games with famous phrases from classical lore. So like you can see an image and it shows a woman springing up from the head of a man that has been cut by an ax. And that obviously references Athena being born from the head of Zeus. Um, there are other ones where if you know Virgil, you'll know a line in Latin. And then if you go look at that illustration, if you have that knowledge front loaded in looking at the illustration, you will see that it's kind of like a cartoon or a picture that embodies the text. So if you know the short Latin phrase, then by looking at the picture, you'll know it's a way of illustrating something from that phrase, but it's, it's not a direct thing where you're just supposed to look at the picture and what it tells you is that phrase. No, it's more like if you're familiar with the classical phrase, it will add another dimension of understanding to the picture that will then help you to make sense of it. Um, so part of the initiation that made the understanding of such things possible was simply a proper classical education, which almost no one has today. Um, and a knowledge of the uh, of the original Latin texts. Um, and another aspect of it that I think probably bears on this is also that there were many people speaking different languages um, in different places in these Protestant dominions. You might be a French speaker, right? In Navarre, you might be a speaker of Dutch um, or Flemish, you know, you might be uh, speaking um, Czech or German. Um, so these texts after a certain fashion were made more international by being, um, set up with pictures. And it also allowed a degree of plausible deniability. If Jesuits wanted to come knocking on your door, you can say, oh no, that picture doesn't mean that it's just a picture. And they can't get you with the text because there's no clear meaning, uh, established. Absolutely. And although the Rosicrucian manifestos were also quite ambivalent, um, yeah, uh, it didn't help Adam Haselmeier. Uh, he was sent off to the galleys by the Jesuits. Yeah, and somebody just mentioned Flemish is Dutch. Yes, I, I know that more or less, which is why I mentioned them at the same time as being roughly the same language. So yeah, the low countries in general, you might be speaking a low country language, you might be speaking a French language. You might be speaking a German language. 
So the Holy Roman Empire is devastated. There's war from 1618 to 1648. And uh, worst off are the Protestant states. For instance, the Palatinate loses around 70% of its population. Um, it is estimated that around 30% of the German population dies, um, or that the population shrinks by 30%. So there's, in 1618, there are 16 million Germans, and at the end of the war, there are 10 million. So this is around 30%, a little more than 30%. In the Palatinate, it's much worse. Um, and yes, in a way, this painting is very sad and nostalgic. It was painted in uh, 1634, so after the death of Frederick V. And here, Frederick wears the Bohemian crown um, of the Kingdom of Bohemia. He wears the scepter and the orb of the Holy Roman Empire, which shows him as the legitimate emperor who he never had the chance to be, and the hat and the sword of the Palatinate. And they mocked him as uh, him and her as the uh, the winter king and queen because they basically reigned for one winter before being, um, you know, having their asses kicked and being thrown out. Yes, um, a good friend of mine from Heidelberg. He is really uh, a patriot in the sense that he's from the Palatinate, and he says, "Oh, if only the Palatinate had won the war." then the world would be a uh, more peaceful place. And then in the long run, we wouldn't have had the problems with the Habsburgs and worse, the Prussians, <laughs> who are up here uh, at the time of the Thirty Years War. They are the electorate of Brandenburg, later Prussia. But they were an early, uh, they were an early Protestant group as well, right? I mean, didn't they, they seized upon Protestantism very early, did they not? Um, yes, so the uh, Saxony and Brandenburg became Protestant. Um, but uh, if I remember correctly, they were not among the founding members of the Protestant Union. And they were more like, okay, Frederick, yeah, very good. You, you, what you're doing is really great, but we don't want to get involved in this too much. Too bad, you know, they could have brought, brought some Prussian organizational skill. No, oh, yeah. They could have taken care of everything. They could have uh, invented the needle gun a little bit early. Yes, sorry. Too bad. Too schade. Um, okay. Um, yes, and uh, that's it. Um, I'm going to close the screen share. And here we are. Just the two of us, no map. Um, so. We're talking about the Rosicrucians um, in the end. I mean, part of what we're doing here is we are trying to find out how secret societies are functioning and if there are secret societies in the present, how they might operate. At least this is something which I am very interested in. And I must say, after looking at the Rosicrucians and later if we look at the Illuminati and the Freemasons, we will see that they were subversive, that they um, were fighting the establishment. They were fighting the establishment in the universities. Uh, they were fighting the Jesuit establishment. Um, the Holy Roman Emperor was a Catholic. So uh, I was wondering, might it be that secret societies are secret because it is something for the underdog? Um, that if you have the power, you don't have to operate in secret, that maybe all those stories about, I don't know, uh, skull and bones, um, Bohemian Grove, that uh, in the end it's not, not so big a thing and there are no secret societies. And if there are secret societies, they're going to be subversive ones. What do you think about this? 
So basically what you're saying is that it's a position that has to be taken by someone who doesn't have the power and therefore they're always already subversive because people with the power wouldn't have to do it that way. Um, um, yeah, I could I could see that. Um, but I, I would at the same time say that there's probably levels, you know, there's, I don't, this is all just guessing, but m my, my way of approaching it is that there are probably, what's the old line from Dune, you know, the Benny Gesserit, you know, there are plans within plans within plans. Um, you, you have to leave a certain how do you say this? You don't get people to do things by telling them what to do. You get them to do things best by letting them think that that's what they do already. And so there are other angles of manipulation uh, and control. Um, and secret societies don't always have to be designed to uh, affect events directly. They can also be set up in order to gather information. You know, we've uh, talked about um, the way in which uh, Catholic confession uh, is a, a great thing to have in your back pocket if you want to gather information and share it, right? We've talked about the way in which our, I've at the pa in the past looked at the way in which priesthoods um, gather information and act as intelligence services in some fashion. You know, in ancient Greece, as I've mentioned before, the, the, the people, when they wanted to do something, would go talk to the Oracle at Delphi or one of the other famous oracles. And that means that the priesthood was hearing the king come and ask the question that mattered most of them. And I mean, if you wanted to understand whether or not some king was about to do something, the questions that he asked when he went to Delphi would probably give you some hint as to what he was likely to do. You know, there's that famous thing about the, the king who went and asked the oracle, you know, what would happen if he attacked such and such? And they said, a great kingdom will fall. You know, and the irony is it was his that fell. But, you know, the point is that they would be able to gather uh, that information and share it. So the idea of the secret society being hidden, I mean, by its very nature, um, you know, would you say that the CIA doesn't have um, power and that the United States doesn't have power? Of course they do. Um, and yet they operate in secret. So. I think it's simpler. I mean, yes, there, there are situations where the underdog has to do it um, in secret because there is no other option. Um, but even when you have options, the, the secret way is often the, the easy way or easier way. And... <laughs> So thinking back of my uh, friend, uh, the patriot of the Palatinate, what do you think would, would have been different if uh, the if Frederick V had won the Thirty Years' War, if he had become emperor? I think the war would have moved to other places. Uh, that 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 war, if I mean, he was he was crowned the king, right? But he he didn't make it to emperor. I mean. Basically, he, he, you, you, you mean what, what would have happened if he had won, for example, at White Mountain and mm -hmm. brought in other supporters? Um, there's no way around that war. And I think it would have just been displaced, right? Like if you if you stick your hand into a thing of water, the water just is displaced and moves to a different position. It doesn't go away. I mean, I was just thinking while we were talking about the business with... Um, you know, viewing it all as one war, but all of these being a series of battles and roughly saying that the war we're talking about started with the Reformation, roughly, because I think you can see the first signs of it, like we talked about with uh, giving us this pletho and the Medicis and the rest, right? Look at what happened in, in France between the Catholics and the Protestants. I mean, look at what's going on between Catholics and Protestants in Ireland. Um, and this is after you know, hundreds of years um, have passed. And, and you know, I was, I, as I said, I was thinking about looking at all as, as one war with multiple battles. I started looking, wow, man, it would probably be interesting to go and look at what role, if any, Freemasons and secret societies played in the uh, Spanish Civil War. Because see, that's another Habsburg domain. You know, the Holy Roman Empire got smashed ultimately 
uh, by Protestants. The Catholics survived, but their power was broken down. I mean, some of the people that I was looking at, the famous um, bankers, you know, if you go and you look up these two families like the fuckers, I love that their actual family name was fuckers. Um, and they decided to, to spell it differently later to make it seem um, less offensive. And the, what was the other group called the, the Welsers or whatever? They were screwed after the 30 years war ended. They were gone. They were destroyed. Their power was smashed. And, you know, basically the, the Catholic powers of Europe limped along for a couple of centuries. And then by the time of the Great War uh, ending, they just totally went under. And then you have uh, Spain sort of remaining. And uh, they got hit with the uh, Spanish Civil War. You know, you had um, France, you know, um, stayed Catholic and, and survived as a Catholic power under under the centralizing control of a, of a Louis the Fourteenth, you know, and they got smashed too. I mean, everybody's been sma got smashed by the Protestants or got smashed by the post Protestants. So I. I think there would have been war. It just would have taken perhaps some different paths. And I think that you would have had a little bit more of that hermetic aspect that would have survived. Um, I know a lot of people like to say, oh, the Masons are behind everything and they all worship an androgyne and they're all into magic and stuff. I, I don't think they are. I think the the flattened Kami version with, it, with a dialectic Manichaeism has become the order of the day to day. I think perhaps some other good aspects of the sort of esoteric side of things might have survived, but um, but I don't know. I mean, human beings are that no, no utopian approach will ever work, and so mm -hmm. you know, human beings are always going to shit themselves, so to speak. They're always going to make a mess. They're always going to cause problems. So I don't know if it. Uh, I don't know if it would have been any better. And I'm not even sure about this idea of, you know, one war with multiple battles. I'm just, I'm finding it very interesting to look at it all like that right now. If you can imagine that roughly a group of people with the same power interests centered around Anglos and Protestant groups in Germany, um, that, that they have been trying to fight out and get their positions. And then if you imagine that the, German Protestants rose to power and the Catholics became less consequential. Meanwhile, the Anglo Protestants rose to power. Catholics remained, but were less consequential. And then you have these two groups fighting it out with the Anglos trying to keep Germany from rising up and becoming powerful. Um, and then America comes onto the scene, which changes the shape of all of it. Yet another uh, Protestant power. So I don't know. I don't know. It's interesting. I do not know. But we have we have other aspects of this that we're going to need to look at eventually. Uh, think, so perhaps a, we can. It's a, it's a f fascinating idea to think of it as a long war uh, between like Catholics and Protestants and post-Protestants. And for instance, um, I mean we have the uh, Rosicrucians, the Illuminati. Um, I, I would have to look more into the Illuminati if their members were. Catholic or Protestant, I think rather Protestant leaning, um, but definitely the Freemasons, um, the first lodge is founded in England and uh, the first lodge in France um, is um, comes from England. So the first Grand Masters, um, I think Montesquieu is uh, also a, a later a Grand Master, but the first Grand Masters are from England, they're Englishmen. Um, and it is definitely the Freemason, the Freemasonic movement that uh, brings about the revolution, whether by conspiracy or whether it's just a functional thing where people share the same ideas and then when it happens, they act um, together. Um, but I definitely see a point here, although with Russia, you also have the Jewish element because you have a huge Jewish population which is disenfranchised and they identify with communism because it promises them a better future in Russia. And also during the 
uh, First World War, the pale of settlement breaks down and the Jews move beyond the pale of settlement to Moscow and they really become the spareheads of the revolution, for instance, the first um, Politburo of the USSR um, consists of seven people, four of them Jews. Um, so, yeah, this is definitely something um, we will explore in the future. On the another aspect to the question, what would have been different? Um, Francis Yates is very enthusiastic, and so are many researchers on the Rosicrucians, and they say they were they were about to bring about a renaissance of their own. Francis Yates called her book the Rosicrucian Renaissance. And there's Rosicrucian also Rosicrucian Enlightenment. Enlightenment. Rosicrucian Enlightenment, yes, the Enlightenment. And if we think of the Enlightenment today, um, it is the total opposite, right? It is uh, Rousseau, it is Voltaire. It is reason here, and then uh, God is here, and uh, like astronomy, astrology. Um, and this is not the case with the Rosicrucians. So, um, I mean, of course, this is counterfactual history, but it's interesting to think, um, how, yeah, how would it have played out? Would we today live in a world where, I don't know, um, the metaphysical... And the physical was not so harshly separated as it is today. Yeah, it's an interesting um, question. And would things like the ultimate flattening of religion into materialism, like we see with um, communism, you know, would that course have had to have been taken? You know, um, so yeah, I I'm uh, I don't know. Um, but in in what you mentioned with um, the Jews, I think it's important to point out because you know when we we're doing the the stream on the Florentine Neoplatonists and bankers and the rest, we, we talked about how we should look at banking, um, and I mentioned the 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 fuckers and um, and and uh, that one other family who had enormous wealth. Um, but I think it's also important to at least note at this time, you know, because we talked about how the Jews were not any kind of major force in banking. Uh, in terms of the Florentine period that we were looking at before. But it does appear that in the period we're talking about now, in the 16th century, you begin to have the idea of what's called the, the court Jew. And that is uh, a Jew who is um, very, very knowledgeable and capable with monetary matters and uh, business and loans and financing. And they would be brought in to... Um, to help the rulers with, you know, securing loans and financing and all the rest. And it looks like the, the big countries where they got on well and began to be taken up early, it's in the Holy Roman Empire. Um, and you have a sort of major court Jews appearing. Now, it's not until the second half of the um, 1500s that you start to see a fair number of them. And then they, they, they begin to become more significant in the 17th century. Um, there was one guy who was mentioned, let's just see if I can get his name so I don't sound like I'm completely talking out of my ass, but specifically related to the business of uh, the Battle of White Mountain and all the rest. Where was this guy? Um, the Habsburgs employed the services of uh, Jacob Bassetti of Prague. Um, he was a Bohemian court Jew and financier, lived 1517 to 1634. Um, so he uh, frequently rendered financial assistance. Um, in this case, he rendered it to Ferdinand, who needed large sums of money for the prosecution of the Thirty Years' War. Um, in recognition, Ferdinand, um, this Catholic, raised him to uh, the title von Treuenberg. I can't even pronounce that. Um, and uh, gave him a coat of arms. Um, and what's interesting is that, uh, or what did they say to him? They said, uh, bestowed upon them right to engage in any business, whatever, in any part of the empire, whether cities, towns, or marketplaces, in Prague and Vienna, and other places where Jews are allowed to res reside or are not, uh, to acquire property and to reside anywhere he pleases, um, his property in any form to be free from taxes, imposts, and duties, um, and other privileges. Um, and then uh, apparently after the Battle of White Mountain, um, 
because of him, uh, Ferdinand ensured that the Hebrew quarter in Prague was protected by a military guard against the attacks of the soldiery. Um, and so that's kind of an interesting thing to think about. Yeah, I wanted to bring it up because you mentioned that things are a little different in Russia where you have the large Jewish population, but in the Habsburg territories, it seems that the Jews began to play a significant role with banking and financing um, that really began to be notable and land them real privileges uh, in the 17th century. So while, for example, we haven't found any real evidence of Jews having much to do at all with, um, with the French Revolution, I think, you know, affairs in the German speaking territories, or let's say the Holy Roman Empire, are probably a little bit different. They seem to, you know, particularly Ashkenazi ones seem to climb the ladder pretty quickly. And so in that sense, I think that where you're going to find Jews, you see two ways that bringing them on board happens. One way is to try the, the idea of the, it's actually an interesting thought. One way is to take the approach of the Masonic Lodge, where they can say inside the lodge, you know, like a blue lodge, you're not going to discuss religion, you're not going to discuss politics, but everyone must be from a religion of the book, right? And you swear your oath on a book or whatever, right? So in that setting, which is kind of the Pico de la Mirandola thing, right? Or the Johannes Reuschlin thing. The idea is that we can all come together in this lodge because we're all people of the book. And therefore there's room to, for us to cooperate as Masons, but we don't necessarily need to be discussing religion or politics specifically in the lodge, right? Whether they did or not, I don't know. But the important thing is that that's a model for how the multiple religions can cooperate. The other angle, and that's why I think this is kind of an interesting way to look at it, is, uh, is to flatten it and say religion doesn't matter, and that kind of yields communism. So you have the idea of the brotherhood of man in the, in the, the, the context of the Masonic lodges, which is the idea that we, we all come from religions of the book, we can all cooperate as Masons, Masons being architects of society, quite literally, right? Um, but then the other angle is to say, forget about the religious aspect, it's all materialism. And that's another way to accommodate the Jews. Um, and I think that we saw with our reformation, a flattening and a secularization. And I've long thought that Zionism is basically just a reformation for Jewish people. Like basically you can just look at Zionism as being like the reformation, but for Jews. And it yields this post-religious strain. And so I think that the post-religious strain of the Jews having undergone their own reformation impacted the secularism, the burgeoning secularism of the Christian West. And it yielded this weird hybrid offshoot that is the flat materialist secularized religion of communism, which we're now struggling to digest. I know that was kind of all over the place, but these are sort of new um, ideas that were occurring to me. So that that kind of fits with the the um, your question earlier. What would have happened if at the Battle of White Mountain, um, Frederick had won? Well, maybe you would have seen a basis for cooperation along the lines of you know the Christian Rosenkreutz kind of arrangement, and perhaps it would have allowed a different basis for cooperation. How do I say this? Basically, Jews and Christians wouldn't have had to throw out religion as thoroughly. And as a result, maybe, though the fighting still would have had to have happened. Again, counterfactual, hypothetical speculation, like you said. But maybe it wouldn't have been necessary to take up this horror show of post-religious materialism that we've been forced down to as a basis for all of us to be together. Anyway, um, we are coming up uh, on three hours, so I'm going to shut my damn mouth, but I have not given you um, the time you need to put together your closing thoughts. So I'd ask you this, um, what are your closing thoughts on this? And then two, can you very briefly tease what you think our next episode would be about? <clears throat> 
So my, if I if I think about it again, um, I think there's a great difference between the way um, the changes have been happening we're talking about in Italy and Germany. So, for instance, in the Florentine re uh, Renaissance, um, the change is initiated by a banker in a city, um, by Cosimo de' Medici, and in the Reformation and in the in Rosicrucianism, it is really initiated by Frederick III, who is the elector of Saxony, who protects Martin Luther, and the princess of Anhalt, and the, what was the name again? Um, uh, the Maurice of Kassel. So they are the ones who make it possible that the Rosicrucian manifestos are published. They are the ones who protect Luther. So this is first, it tells us something about the power structure. And then also the way the Rosicrucians, the lead, the people who wrote the Rosicrucian manifestos, the way they thought about antiquity and about morals and science is quite different from the way the Florentines thought about it. For instance, Pico and uh, Marsilio Ficino. So in Ficino and in uh, Pico della Mirandola, we see an admiration of the, <coughs> of the past, uh, of uh, Plato and the Neoplatonists, um, and also of the uh, Prishi theology like uh, Zoroaster and Pythagoras. But in the Rosicrucians, it is more mixed, of course. There are some uh, who are very much in favor of the ancients, but then you have, for instance, Adam Haselmeyer, who says that, no, this ancient knowledge, we don't need it at all. All we need is the Bible. And or your ex or your example of Paracelsus. You know, we must experiment. We must, you know, just, just nature can guide us. Yes, and so in this regard, um, I think maybe it's just that they are like 50 or 100 years be in between, but I think also the fact that you have this one movement in Italy, uh, and you have the other movement in Germany, and this brings about something uh, quite different. And as a teaser for next time, um, so what we're going to do is we are going to look at, I'm not 100% sure right now because a lot of those figures we were talking about, like uh, uh, Christian of Anhalt, who was the military leader of the Protestant Union, he found so-called reading circles big time. One of them, the Palm Orden, uh, in English, the Order of the Palm, of the Palm Tree. Yes, um, this is a huge order. There's so many members. On, and for instance, Johann Valentin André who wrote the third Rosicrucian Manifesto, he also becomes a member. So they are all there, the good old friends. And there is not a lot of research done on this. And um, I mean, of course, everybody talks about the Illuminati. Uh, there's a lot of books, a lot of movies out there. And for sure, we will talk about them. Um, and I think I will also translate like a part of their uh, published manifestos uh, of their published uh, um, documents, um, involuntarily uh, published documents published by um, the King of Bavaria, by Jesuits. Uh, I will publish, I think, a part of them into English. It has not been done before. This is going to be a, uh, yeah, th this is going to be nice. Um, so, yeah, I'm just going to delve into all kinds of uh, secret societies preceding the Illuminati, the Illuminati themselves. Maybe we're going to keep it to this, or maybe we're going to add the Freemasons, but this would mean also the French Revolution. I think at the moment, maybe we're going to do another episode on the French Revolution, um, uh, if you can uh, bear with me. <laughs> uh, I'm happy to go as far with it as you'd like. You know, we could go all the way up to uh, even to uh, 
to Crowley and the Golden Dawn and all uh, that sort of stuff with uh, World War One and World War Two. I do know that there's some interesting things with Crowley and the Ordo Templi Orientis, and again, secret societies and the English and the Germans, um, which is uh, very, very interesting indeed. We see the same themes uh, going forward. So yeah, we'll have to see. Yes, um, we go as far as we can, uh, as far as we, I would like to go as far as we find relevant stuff to talk about. Uh, you're muted. Yes, I'm muted. Um, so yeah, we should uh, probably wrap this one up. Uh, I will say um, that I definitely look forward to you uh, translating that stuff on the Illuminati into English because, you know, if you put that together, you can polish it up and uh, put it out for sale. And uh, the fact that it has not been translated into English, I think you'd find a surprisingly wide uh, audience for it. So that's always a good thing. That's what led us to start talking about all this in the first place. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, for my end, I don't have anything to say other than thank you very, very much indeed. Um, is there anywhere anybody can follow you other than on uh, Twitter? And do you have any plans to set up a channel of your own? Uh, it's Twitter for the moment. Um, about setting up a YouTube channel, um, maybe long term, uh, short term, um, I'm just going to keep harassing uh, innocent YouTubers like you. Sounds good. Okay. Well, then um, but we'll be back soon, ladies and gentlemen, to uh, do another episode in this. Uh, again, my thanks to Anteos. Thanks to all of you for, uh, for joining us. And uh, we will be back soon. Until then, uh, I am Semi Agog, and I am out. <laughs>